Had many talks. <laughs> had many talks. I think I see you talking to uh, my brother over there. You're a fornicator in the eyes of God. So I have another question that is related to I know. Since uh, what you're saying is that true marriage should happen, there, is, God there hates doesn't sinners. have to be any What's sort of What's that? Yeah, I know he's saying God hates right? sinners. I didn't say that. He has a holy hatred for them. It's a righteous hatred. Papers given for marriage and divorce and Here, let, let's kind of step over here, just, just verse, in case they kind of... What the verse that says, Romans 5.8. Yeah, I, I quoted that. I think I quoted that to you. We have to balance it too. So Psalm 5 says, God hates all workers of iniquity. But then you have Romans chapter 5, verses 5 through 8. I think I quoted that to you earlier. And it, and it says, for when we were still without strength, in due time, meaning at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man would one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us we're sinners but notice what he's saying there is he's saying maybe you might die for your mom maybe you might die for your child I'm not saying you have one but let's say you did maybe you might die for who you think's a good person but Jesus died for you when you hated him in your sin and because of that you have to balance it with Romans or I'm sorry uh, Psalm 5 5 that God hates sinners and the reason why is because God gave up his son and if you despise that and you're like, forget that, I'm going to sin, God has a hatred. So, if there are sinners, why is he preaching since there are sinners that God loves them, even he, though there are sinners? He's doing both. Right now, he's actually answering questions. So, like, it's like you. If you ask me a question, I haven't, I'm going to respond to whatever you're talking to me about but if you listen to him preach we typically will get bad news and good news like i was walking out of that library and i heard two women as they were walking down because i was behind them and they didn't know i was behind them and i heard him say something like warning well going to hell or something like that and i used that as an opportunity to tell them but you don't have to they didn't realize I was behind them. It's like, you don't have to. You can turn to Jesus. You can have forgiveness. You know, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's both. You got to give them the bad news so they understand why you have to turn to Jesus. It's just like the analogy I gave a young man over here uh, a little while ago. Let's, let's say I come to you. Let's say I come to you with a vial. And I'm like, dude, take this. You've got cancer. And you're like, whoa, dude, I don't have cancer and I'm like yeah you do man you really do you're gonna be like bro I'm not drinking that but if I come to you and I say look man I met with your doctor I, I look at your test results man your body is riddled with cancer I sold everything I've got to get you this you would gobble that stuff down why because I showed you your, your issues that's what these signs do that's what we do when we preach you got to get them to understand they're in condemnation right now but they don't have to stay that way 
Christianity right. is a so, I'm Actually, having, Christianity spread to Ethiopia and Africa I, before it ever I made any other place. Every 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 that version of the sign. But you mm-hmm. understand something, sir. And I'm not a Roman. I'm a Christian. Saying, like, I'm not here to talk about Rome. We are Roman. sinners. I'm here to talk about but Jesus. There is a solution. Amen. Come there was a church in Rome called Rome. Right. The Saints I feel like the way this sign is kind of displayed, but it's split up. It's kind of just like a little too far on the Roman Catholic Church split up. I'm not part of it. I'm not even a Protestant. I feel like, I mean, no, I've heard it a lot today. I hear this a lot. So you're, you're, I don't know if you're right. me like, no, no, keep, keep the bad news, the but like, kind of like, well, like, the, like, the, like these signs here, this, we know this is not an exhaustive list, but we do know, like, that, is that true? Is that sign true? Even if it's bad news? Think about Jonah. God told Jonah, go into that city of Nineveh and tell them what I tell you. He goes into the city and he declares, God is going to destroy you in 40 days. He gave them no hope. He gave them condemnation. That was from God. And guess what those men did? They repented. They turned away from their sin. And God didn't destroy the city because of what they did. And God didn't give them no good news. We're actually giving them good news with the bad. Yeah, I feel like just invoking more of that, like, hope. Right. Uh, Yeah. I mean, we give them both. Once again, the the cancer analogy, you've got to understand. You've got to understand what the problem is. And if you look at the signs, it's, it's just like a stop sign or a red light. The red light doesn't hate you. It's warning you, don't cross okay, yes. you get hit don't cross this stop sign don't just run it in the middle of a busy intersection you could die same here it's just it's a stop sign stop it this is a warning you know turn the other way and then the other side of the sign is you don't have to go to hell like that sign back there don't go to hell jesus died for you you think oh my yes you are insane so like taking a look at this sign what's that you taking a look at this side of the sign mm-hmm. Do you think it's like necessary to like miss them out and point people out? Yeah. To not when it's not that we're. It's kind of like the old um, the old saying: if the shoe fits, wear it. Although I don't want you to wear it, I want you to take it off. You know what I mean? But you have to make it very specific because if you just say sinners. Which there's nothing wrong with that, but not everybody knows, like, like I get, like this, I was just getting ready to say that. Somebody likes to come up and they like to go, why are Muslims up there? Well, there's a reason for that. First off, they're not a race, it's a religion. Most, some people actually think it's a race. It's like, dude, it's a religion. Muslims believe that Jesus is not the son of God. That he was switched out and it was Judas that died on the cross. And it, so it's like, now wait a minute, but your Quran, which I have like three of them at home, your Quran says to believe in the people of the Injil, the people of the gospel. You're supposed to listen to me. I'm giving you the truth. And then they say, well, your man, you, corru- you guys corrupted the, the manuscripts. And I'm like, now hold on. The Quran was put together in the 600s. And many of our manuscripts predate the 600s. So you got a big problem. And I talked to a Muslim yesterday and he didn't have an answer for it because there is no answer for it. You got to be honest with the truth. So that's why they're on there. So you have to point out specific things. And these are like more the prevalent sins that we run into a lot on college campuses. You got to point this stuff out so they understand this is sin. This is, you're going to, you're going to like have an everlasting destruction, man. There's no warning too great. I mean, dude, if take somebody you love and and they, they're getting ready to walk in here and you know they're, they're, the place is rigged with bombs. You know it for a fact and your loved one walks in there. You're going to do anything you can to stop that. If you have to take them by the hand and drag them away. No, listen to me, dude. I'm serious. You're going to do that. No warning is too strong. You know, and, th- and this, at least they'll blow up and die. We're talking about an everlasting fire. No, we're talking about an everlasting fire. So that's why it's specific because they need to understand these specific sins. So I understand. I understand. The, 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 and it does. It they rouse people up. Right. Then again, it's it's interesting because people will typically that don't do this. They'll they'll sit there and well, can't you guys get rid of the signs? But the signs draw people in and and it gets them to come up and talk to us. If I just stand here without my sign, hardly anybody comes up. It's like they're in it. Like, why, why are you condemning us? So then I talk to them, and they listen. Some of them just mock. Some mockers stick around. So 
the signs work. I mean, think about it. Why do we have billboards all over the highways? You know why? Because they work. You look at them. <laughs> so that's why we use them. You know, they're 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 very they're very helpful. So I understand your perspective right. of like drawing people in and um, right. pointing out the specific things. Right. I just feel like is what I see, like even as a Christian, mm. just like aggressiveness. Mm. But was Jesus aggressive? But he was also graceful. Yes, he was. Who was he graceful to? The sinners. Yes, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. But was he graceful to the proud sinners or the very meek sinners? The ones that realize, man, I'm a sinner. I need salvation. Like you, I've been graceful with you. I've been graceful with sinners walking around today that just talk to me. I've been very, very graceful with that. But if somebody comes up and they're like, you sin, we all sin, F, F you, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to rebuke them hard like Jesus did. Yeah, that's exactly what, if you read John chapter 8, when all the Jews, these weren't just Pharisees. Jesus says things like, you know, you're of your father, the devil. You do the bidding, the works of your father, the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning. You're just like him. And he sat there and told them, Jews, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. These are Jews that believed in Jesus. They, it says that, I can show you in the Bible if you want to see it for yourself. But if you read John chapter 8, I think it's, I can't remember what verse off the top of my head, but it may be verse 51. But he sits there, actually, why don't I just bring it up so I can show you. Wait, I can pull it up. Is, where's the verse again? I'm sorry. Uh, John chapter 8. Everybody right, it is 51. So, in verse 51 there, he tells them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Meaning we have to obey him, or we abide in death. Now, if you read the whole chapter, we'll kind of... Go ahead. What did you say? If a man keeps my saying, which means his, his sayings, his teachings, he will never see death. Mm -hmm. That's what Jesus said. So, so that's something oh, we shit. have to do. If he doesn't, oh, 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 no, no, no. Okay, I, I don't know what that is. But, um, so, uh, go ahead. We don't keep the saying, we will see death, or do you, because you're being disobedient. But even if you're in Christ, if you go back to your sin, what's the wages of sin? Dad, but can't you repent? And yes, you can. Okay. But we just so we define our terms. Repentance no, isn't no. like if I leave here and I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna lie and then I'm gonna ask Jesus to forgive me. That's yeah, not repent. That's yeah, playing games. I understand. If I do sin, not when. That's where a lot of Christians get it wrong. They think when you sin because we all still sin, and the Bible doesn't teach that. But if you sin. 1 John 2, 1 says, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So there's hope for you if you do sin, you can repent, you can confess and turn away from it and the Lord will forgive you, he will cleanse you again. Um, but Jesus, if you're following Jesus, he doesn't lead you into sin at all. He always leads you into holiness. So if I, it's like a drill sergeant, I used to be in the military. If I'm following my sergeant, my sergeant's not gonna lead me to join China right the ccp the communist chinese party of, of you know uh, china he's not going to lead me to join russia right he's going to lead me to fight for america and by the way i'm not advocating for fighting okay i'm a christian i'm just using that analogy that if i'm following jesus he leads me to do holiness so if i do sin i'm no longer following jesus i need to repent and turn back to him so it also, talk, it also talks about his appearance not being worn the way you know that this is a bronze beautiful. He was, he was a normal looking, just a, just a, a very, you know, normal looking person. Nothing, not, not attractive yeah. or anything yeah. like that. I don't know. Isaiah 53. So, if you're talking specific, about the picture, you know, I agree with you. That's kind of like, points people out. I feel like a single thing. You're alone you're and you're, you're going to hell. Well, I mean, I'm not going, I'm not sitting here going, you're a sinner, you're a sinner. Like, I don't know that, right? It's just a sign. Uh, you're not upsetting me, dude. Don't worry about that. <laughs> you ain't going to offend me. It don't matter if you scream in my face. I'll just be like, okay, whatever, dude. You know? I'm not saying that, but that's a... Uh, I get it. I hear that a lot. And it's just, it's just a warning. Like I said, man, I mean, when you think about this, when you go back to your dorm or home, wherever you're staying, just think about it, man. Like, we're talking about everlasting fire, man. There's nothing worse than that. Like, that's terrible mm -hmm. not only that well on top of that they're never going to have what they enjoy 
all this sin that they love, it's not going to be there. The devil doesn't control hell. That's, that's nonsense. If you read the Bible, the devil gets thrown into hell. It's God's jail cell for sinners, you know? So if God's controlling hell, that's his punishment. That's his, but he don't want anyone to go there. And he literally did everything he could so that none of us would ever see it. But if you won't follow him, what else could he do? He's not going to make you because then it's not love. It's, it's essentially rape, right? It, it, it has, you have to respond accordingly. There has to be free will. You have to make the choice, you know? So yeah, I mean, the sign, you know, like this, it, it points out certain sins, which are very common today, but they have to understand these sins are sending you to hell. Yeah. You don't have to go there. I was just, you know, speaking hmm? to your brother over there. Yeah. And my brother, I, I mean, he's, he's my brother in the faith. He's not yeah, literally yeah, my yeah, brother. Okay. I want to make sure. <laughs> But what I basically told them is, um, like, I wish you guys did more of like brought people on into like a church or into a church community because I feel like mm -hmm. that's what makes the most change in people. Because, um, like, go ahead. Hey, Frank. This kind of just like points it out, mm -hmm. and you guys can only do so much like preaching on the street. Mm -hmm. I wish you guys, or I wish there was like a option to like go. Oh, I yeah, I get. Like, come and join this church and we'll we'll show you who Jesus mm -hmm. really is and right. stuff like that. Yeah, the, because, the because church, I, go ahead. I, that, just like that deeper mm -hmm. understanding is needed. I, I feel like that just can't be done on, a, on the street. So, we remember as Christians, we have to obey the Bible, what he says, and not think what we think is best. Um, so Jesus commands us, now not everybody has to street preach, but we all must proclaim the gospel. Now, he commands us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, which is what we're doing. And this is the most biblical method you see in the Bible. Literally from the Old Testament all the way through the New. God called prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah. He even told Ezekiel, you go and preach these people, but they're not even going to hear you. If that was us, we'd be like, but then why am I doing it, God? If they're not going to repent, it doesn't matter why. God said to do it. You know, it, God gets glory in doing this. So you see it all through the book of Acts. They all go out into the open squares proclaiming the word of God. Paul was tortured. The apostles were tortured for doing what we're doing. Now, yes, they didn't have banners, but they preached exactly what we were doing out loud. Now, the church, real quick, the Greek word is ecclesia. Now, it's really not an accurate translation to say church. Okay. The, the ecclesia means congregation assembly. So for example, in Koine Greek, which is what the New Testament was written in, if I saw like uh, Biden running for president and there's a big assembly around him, I would say that's the ecclesia of Biden. It doesn't literally mean church building, okay? So the ecclesia is the people, the saints of God. You're either in Christ or you're not. Now. Yes, we meet in buildings. Now my church, I'm a pastor, my church is actually in my home, in my living room. Um, you'll see it on YouTube, I got a pulpit and everything. We have it in my, fellow, in my living room. Um, but the church is for saints, for Christians, not for sinners. Now I'm not saying that it's unbiblical for a sinner to visit. But I'll show you what I'm talking about if you wanna see it. If you go, if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter five, Paul tells you not to even eat now. with someone yeah, who's named a brother that's living in sin. Okay. So Go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It's at the very end. A Muslim person who follows the God of Allah. How does he follow the God of Allah? He does it by following the prophet Muhammad. If you start, let's get the context. Now, he's dealing with a, a so-called Christian that's having sex with a stepmother. You realize okay, that's the context if you read back in the beginning of uh, chapter 5. And he rebukes them for this. Verse 6, he says, Your glorying is not good. Know ye that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? What he's saying is a little leaven, if you know anything about baking, it'll explode everything else. He's like, get it out. Leaven represents sin. All right? He goes on and he tells them in verse 7, Purge out therefore the old leaven that you may be new in Christ. He goes goes on in verse 9, I wrote unto you in an epistle, meaning letter, not to company, not to fellowship 
with fornicators. So if somebody's in, set, in, in sexual immorality claiming to be a Christian, they're not to be in the church. They're to be kicked out. Um, he goes on. He explains. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of the world or with covetous or extortioners or with idolaters because then God would have to take you out of the world. We're around that now. He's not saying this is wrong. But he goes on in verse 11. But I have told you, I'm just paraphrasing. I told you if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, sex outside of marriage, covetous, they're greedy. Think of Christmas, a lot of people are greedy. An idolater, they have a different view of Jesus. A lot of Christians are idolaters. They have this lovey-dovey Jesus who just loves people and their sin no matter what. That's idolatry. That's not the Jesus of the Bible. Um, a railer, that's somebody that uses abusive language, cursing or calling like, I think railing even is like calling a homosexual uh, F-A-G. That's, that's garbage. I think that's railing. There, there's no need for that. Or a drunkard, somebody gets drunk. Or an extortioner, somebody that takes money from others. Not to even eat with such a person. And he goes on and, and says, what do I have to do to what do I have to do with judging them that are outside? Now, somebody may take that out of context and say, you guys can't judge these people outside. That's not what he's saying. The judgment he's talking about is you don't have to break fellowship with them. So, for example, I can come out here and if some of these sinners want to sit down and eat with me so I can preach the gospel to them, I can do that. If you're calling yourself a brother in Christ and you're committing those sins, I cannot eat with you because you're blaspheming God. You're not really a Christian, you're lying. You see what I'm saying? Wow. So the church, ecclesia, doesn't mean a church building, it's the assembly, the congregation of God, okay? Just like if I saw Trump, like I gave you the egg thing with Biden, if I saw Trump supporters out there, if I was speaking Koine Greek, I'd say, look, it's the ecclesia of Trump. It just means assembly, congregation, okay? So church is actually for saints, they be, we go out into the world, we preach the gospel to them. Luke chapter 8, Jesus said, scatter the seed. And the seed is the word of God. You give them the word of God. And some of that seed falls to the wayside, which means that's those that hear the word of God being preached and the devil comes and takes it out of the heart they never believe. All right, that'll happen today. There are some that hear the word of God and it's like the seed that falls on stony ground, like this concrete. If you know anything about that, like some, some of the, if a seed dropped there and it starts raining, it sprouts up immediately. There's life. And Jesus says, that's those that hear the word of God and they have a hard heart. And the cares and, 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 and or no, during times of trouble and tribulation, during times of temptation, they fall away. That's those that believed for a while. And when they were tempted, they went back to their sin and they died. Just like this, there's no ground beneath it. It's gonna die. And then there's some seed that some people that hear the word of God, their heart receives it, but it's like the thorns and thistles that choke up, choke out the plant. And that's those that hear the word of God, yet the distractions of the world, the cares for the world, the money of the world, it chokes out and eventually they fall away. But some people hear the word of God that falls on good ground and it brings forth good fruit. You know, and that's those that have a decent heart that are willing to receive the word of God and get right with God. So, so all we can do is scatter the seed. That's what I do. That's what we do. So, you don't think like, um, like let's say, let's say I'm a Christian and I have a brother who's who proclaimed themselves as a Christian, but mm -hmm. they were tempted and they fell back into sin. Mm -hmm. Like I can't associate with them anymore. If like, they if they refuse to repent, no. If they will repent, yes. So, and then that's my Because remember, I believe the Bible. That's what 1 Corinthians 5 says. So if I have a brother, like I'm a pastor of a fellowship. If, if that's my deacon there, or let's use my brother over here. If he comes to me, he's like, man, like, uh, let's say he lied. And he's like, man, I lied. And I'm like, have you repented? No. Well, then you're not fellowshipping with us until you repent. 1 Corinthians 5. It's not happening. You know what I mean? So... So you can't associate with them? Not, you can if they say, I'm not following Jesus anymore. I'm a former backslider. I was in the faith for seven years. And I went back to my sin, but I wasn't pretending. I'm a Christian. I was like, nah, man, I'm not right with God. Mm -hmm. Then you can eat with me, even being a Christian. But if I walk around as a sinner and I'm like, I'm a Christian and I'm a sinner, you're not even to eat with me. So my question would be then, you can only eat with them if you know that they're gonna repent. If they say they have repented. If they're still like, if they, if they come to you 
and they're like, dude, man, I'm still, I'm still watching porn. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, have you repented? Yeah, I've repented. I'm like, okay, if you've repented, maybe you need to get rid of your computer, man. Maybe just go get a grandma flip phone, dude. Do whatever it takes so you don't get back into that. Maybe instead of being tempted to masturbate, take a cold shower. Do whatever you gotta do, okay? So, so if they repent of it, yeah. But if they're like, no, nah, man, I, I'm, I'm still, I'm, I haven't repented, I'm still looking at porn, and it's like, are you claiming to be a Christian? Yeah. Well, then I'm not eating with you. So then, and it's not like in a mean way, like, rrr, rrr. it's, dude, you're blaspheming God. You're making a mockery of him. My man. question would be then, like, how do you know if they ever are going to repent? Like, it, that's, I feel right. like that's something that is up to God. That's not up to us. And I, I think right. our, our role in that is not to, like, encourage that, but mm. not to, like, I feel like if somebody is, like, struggling with sin and they said that they're not going to repent it, mm. it's not... Our role isn't to be like, okay, then get away from it. Our role is to be like... Well, remember, I gave you 1 Corinthians 5. Your role is to do that. You are not to eat with a brother that's calling himself... Uh, somebody that's called a brother. He's calling himself a Christian. Mm -hmm. If they call themselves a Christian and they're covetous, they're an idolater, they're a fornicator, having sex outside of marriage, if they say, I'm a Christian, you're not supposed to eat with them. Now, I will give you this. In today's society, this is a hard thing because, unfortunately, many people have gotten a wrong gospel. So, like, I use discretion with it to a degree. It's like, okay, was this person, did they get a false gospel of, well, we're just a bunch of sinners, Jesus loves you anyways, right? But I can tell you now, like, if it's my fellowship, as a pastor, if I don't do that, I'm in sin, because I don't love you. Like, there, to sit there and just go along with, well, I'm a Christian, I'm having sex outside of marriage. If I don't do what the Apostle Paul said there, I don't love that person. I'm basically going, it's okay, man. It's okay. I don't love you, dude. You're, you're on your way to hell. I don't love you at all. But I thought... Um, if they repent, yes. I thought Paul also said to... Um, when a brother is in sin, to call them out on it. Yeah. And I feel like... Shouldn't we... Isn't our role to call them out on our sin? Like, so well, they so can, like... So for they can recover from Right, it. right. That's a good one. So if you look at Galatians chapter 6... This is was written by Paul too, and this is what I would advise to you if somebody's called a brother and, and he's in sin. It says, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, meaning he sinned against God, ye which are spiritual, notice that guy that sinned, he's not spiritual. See that? I believe the word of God. I don't believe what man says. Brethren, brothers, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you that are spiritual, he's no longer spiritual, he's in sin, he's dead. He's cut off in a sin. Oh, so then. Right. So then. But I'm, is, well, I'm not finished yet, but okay. he goes on. Restore such a one. Now, let me ask you something. Why does he need restored? I thought he's a Christian no matter what. He says, restore him. Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Be gentle at first. You know what I mean? So, I guess back to our original situation yeah. where I have a brother who claims to be a Christian, mm -hmm. sin, and hasn't repented. Well, if they haven't repented, aren't they like dead? Yes. And they aren't in Christ anymore? So, right. then, so then, do we ever really need to be separated from anybody because if they truly sinned and didn't repent then they're no longer if they were yeah right they're not in christ so but 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 if they're claiming to be a christian if they say no i'm not a christian man i'm not right with god yeah you can eat with them. but i mean now what i will say is this my my next question would be okay did they really receive the true gospel of, look, man, you've got to turn from your sins, surrender your life to Jesus and follow him, obviously be baptized after that water and truly obey Jesus by the power of his spirit living in you? You know, now, or did they receive a fake gospel of you're just a, you're a sinner, just confess Jesus with your mouth and just continue in your sin. Nobody tells you you need to turn away from it, right? A lot of churches preach it. So that's what I would preface it with is what has he been told? You know, so like if you know this person, go give him the true gospel. Tell him the truth. And if he refuses to repent after that, then yeah, I mean, that the scriptures say that. But if this is what I would say, and I could be wrong, this is my opinion. If you give him the true gospel and he and he tells you, well, I've never heard that before, then he's never even been a Christian. Right? You know, he's never known the truth. Yeah, you know, that's why we go out on college campuses because many people they don't hear the truth. They get told by these lying pastors. I'm not saying they're all lying. I'm a pastor, 
but many of them are a bunch of liars. They pass around tithing, tithing plates like, oh, you know, give your 10 percent. When that's not even in the New Testament, that's an Old Testament law. It's kind of funny, and it's sad, but it's comical because it's like they're against law, quote unquote. They're against obeying Jesus, but they want to keep an Old Testament law of give me your 10%. Meanwhile, their church is big, fancy. The pastor's driving around a Mercedes Benz or something, $500,000 home, and it's like, really? That's not, that's not, that's not the walk, man. So, is it wrong for a pastor to ask for money? No. Actually, 1 Corinthians 9, like us, yeah, like us street preaching, it says, uh, God says that you shall not muzzle out the ox while he treads the grain. So, and Paul says, is, is, does God care about oxen or is he speaking this for our sakes? And he says, our sakes, no doubt. So that he that plows, plows in hope. So basically, like, I don't ask for offerings. People can give if God wants them to give, right? And I do get donations at times. And all that money, every dollar that we receive gets spent on banner signs, uh, preaching equipment, a bunch of gospel tracks. You know, that's what it goes towards because I work a job to earn my own money. Um, but I am not saying it's a sin for a pastor because a pastor should devote himself to prayer reading the word even more, you know, taking care of his congregation, going into the prisons, right? And I can tell you right now, it's hard as a pastor because I work a full-time job driving a semi, I pastor, I counsel, I get emails, I pass out gospel tracts, people email me. It's like, people leave comments on YouTube. It's like, I can't, I can't, I literally can't answer everybody. I try, I try to do some, but like YouTube, usually I won't even respond because I just don't have the time in the day to do it. Plus I'm married with kids, you know? Uh, but I do get like this week, I'm taking this week off from work. I don't get paid for it. I lose money. I'm an owner operator, so I don't get paid to take this time off. And I go out and I preach because I love people. And frankly, I really love going to college, man, because people will talk. I go to concerts and you deal with the old people like me, the older people, and they just walk by like, mm, mm. you know, most of them, it's like most of them don't even care, man. And why is that? Because the Bible says sin hardens the heart. The longer you continue in the sin, the harder your heart gets. So when I give you the word of God, it bounces right off. Remember Luke chapter eight, what Jesus said? It just, it just bounces off, man. I know I've been there. Remember I backslid, I went back to my sin for a while. My heart got really hard, man. Sin ain't, sin's, it's dangerous, man. It hardens the heart bad. But see, you guys are young enough where you're open to, I'll hear you out. And you may walk away and be like, I don't believe a word that dude said, but I did my job. So, like say um, somebody comes up to you who's like a sinner, like they don't believe in God. Mm -hmm. Would you, like, and they were like, I want to join like your church or I want to join the place where you right. preach or pray or get together. For right. To learn about God, would you allow that? I would, first I would have to make sure they understand the gospel. I would take them to Luke 4, 14, 26 first. I'd say, okay, are you willing to count the cost? Because before you even turn to Jesus, you got to count the cost first. Jesus said in Luke 14, 26, whoever comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. That sounds really mean. Now, Jesus is not endorsing you to hate these people. What he's doing is he's speaking in hyperbole. He's telling you, look, if you come to me, I have to be on the throne of your heart. I have to be above all. You know why? Because Matthew chapter 10, it says, a man's enemies will be those of his own household. That is true, man. If you become a Christian and you truly follow Jesus with all your heart, the world's gonna hate you. The world hated Jesus. Jesus said in John 7, 7, the world hates me because I testify of it that his works are evil. John chap chapter 15, Jesus said, a servant is not greater than his master. If they hated me, they're gonna hate you. That's why Jesus warned people, you better count the cost before you come. Are you willing to lose it all? Are you willing to have your wife hate you? Hypothetically, you're married. Are you willing to have your kids hate you? Are you willing to get made fun of and be a mockery and be a fool for Jesus? It's gonna happen. And if you're willing to count that cost, now the next step is I would point them to, okay, then you need to repent. Turn away from all of your sin, 
turn in a childlike faith to Jesus Christ, calling out to him, man, forsaking it all, so giving up your life, they would have to and do, then get baptized after that. They would have to do all of that first before even... Yeah, they'd have to be a Christian. I don't like... I will... What's that? Before even, like, trying to join Yeah, I mean, I, I have taken sinners in, but they're not part of the fellowship. So, for example, like, my daughter, she's part of the fellowship, and her husband is an unbeliever. Now... Unbeliever in the sense of he's not a born-again Christian, but he does believe in Jesus mentally. That's not enough to save you. Demons believe that. And I've given him the gospel, but there's things he don't want to let go of. But if he wants to come, as long as he's respectful, sometimes he comes. But he, he, he hardly ever comes. Because a sinner doesn't want to sit there and hear the truth of the gospel because it convicts them. But at least my question is, too, is like, are you at least willing to like let sinners in to hear the gospel being preached? Well, my, my fellowship is actually in my living room, in my home. So like if somebody emails me, um, if they email me, I would feel them out first. I'd have to talk to them, get to know them, understand them. Um, I have taken people in I don't personally know just because somebody else has vouched for them. Like most of my congregation is actually from across this country. Uh, this brother, that brother in the purple there, God told him to leave Florida, come to Ohio and join my church. This brother there, God told him leave Indiana, go to Ohio. Um, that brother there, God made it very clear after the second time he visited, this is your home. He came from Arizona. He did that for God. Come on, man, Arizona's way nicer weather than here, right? I don't like cold weather. Uh, his wife, he recently got married. She left Georgia, joined her husband up here. I got another sister that God told her, leave California, come to Ohio, join my fellowship. Most of my fellowship consists of people that are across this country. The only people that are from Ohio is me, my wife, uh, well, living in Ohio at the time, me, my wife, and John, the other elder of the fellowship, and his wife. The whole congregation consists of people that are out of state. No, I. Yeah, so. That's, that's, that's very nice. Yeah, it's it's amazing, dude. Like when I when I started this, I had no desire to be a pastor. The whole time I've been a Christian, I'm like, forget that. It's way too much responsibility, because I'm gonna give an account for other people. That is terrifying. You know what I mean? And but then God started calling me to pastor. I had a desire for the first time to do that. And uh, when we started off, man, we le we left. Uh, we left a church that we were going to, and uh, when we stepped out, I was not planning to start any church fellowship. God put it all together, man. It's amazing. Yeah. But that, that's, what pe that's what God does for people that want the church. He's going to lead you, man. You know what I mean? And I don't have all the answers. You know, you got my information. You know, if you ever feel inclined to email, sometimes I do live streams on YouTube. You can come in there and ask whatever you want, man. I am busy, so I don't have a live stream like every week. But occasionally I do have one where I, I answer questions. If somebody has a question, they can come in and ask. Them. Usually I do that Saturday morning. Um, and if you have questions, you can email me. I'll do my best to get back with you. Um, I am very busy. So that's why I do the question and answer live stream because it's so much easier for me to just talk instead of... I, I drive a truck, dude. Like, I, you know what I mean? Like, I drive a truck. I go home. I only have so much time. You know, so it's... it's it's kind of hard to answer everybody, right? Are you judging me? I understand. Do you have any other questions? Or? Um, I don't know. Just like, I appreciate like one on one speaking, right. like, sharing testimonies, right. stuff like that. I just wish, I don't know. I understand. It's a hard thing, man. I, I get it, man. I, I get it. I understand why you're right. right. uh, on the side, but. It's just like Jesus. I mean, Jesus, he preached bad news a lot. I would really encourage you to read all of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and look at how many times Jesus preached about the love of God and count how many times he preached about condemnation, hellfire, turning from sin, um, you know, cutting off body parts, like doing whatever it takes, forsaking your family. Uh, Luke chapter 9. I talked about this earlier. Luke chapter 9. A man comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, I'll follow you. Let me bury my father. Think about that. This man comes to Jesus and he says, I will follow you, Jesus. Let me bury my father. What do you think Jesus said? Do you think Jesus is like, I understand, man. You, you know, you can. Uh, I remember. He isn't, said. Isn't that verse because um, 
the Jewish burial process was very lengthy. It had nothing to do with that. He just said he just simply told them, "Let the dead bury their own dead. You go preach the gospel." Right. That sounds mean, but it's the truth. He's saying, "Let the spiritually dead, because they don't follow me, let them bury their own dead." There's nothing you can do for him. You go preach the gospel. That matches up with Luke 14, 26. If you come to me and you put me, if you put them above me, don't even follow me. Don't waste my time. I mean, that's a str he, sp he spoke that to a crowd. Can you imagine me sitting out here right now? And I do preach that, by the way. Luke 14, 26, and I start preaching out loud. Jesus said, if you come to him and you don't hate your father and mother, your wife and children, your brothers and sisters, yes, your own life also, you can't even be a disciple. You can't be a Christian. Dude, if I preach that and you didn't know me and you weren't talking to me, you'd probably be like, that is not Jesus. But it is Jesus. It's what he preached. It's interesting because Jesus also preached a lot of this. He did. He did, like the woman caught in adultery, or right? Like she was about to be stoned. Taking on his way, like, like uh, uh, what is it called? Gay colors. The things that the oxen wear. The, uh, the seven colors. Right, 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 right. right. And, and, and then that is true. He said, come to me. All you are weary, that's a good one. For my way is gentle. He said, come to me, all you that are weary and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly at heart, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's a good one. But if you look at the verses before that, I believe that's... I, think it's Matthew. I, I know it's Matthew. I think... I don't know if that's... I, for some reason, I think that's Matthew. I think it's Matthew 11. Yeah. Now, let's read the context. If you start, I'm not going to quote it all to you, but you look at this later, man. This is right after he condemned whole cities. Look at this. Jesus says, Woe to you, Chorazin, verse 21. It's Matthew chapter 11, verse 21. You ready? I'll just kind of paraphrase it. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For the mighty works which were done in you have been done in Tyre and Sidon. They would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, you think you're exalted to heaven, but you're going to be brought down to hell. For the mighty works which have been done in thee have been done in Sodom. It would have remained to this day. But I say to you, it'll be more tolerable in, the, in Sodom for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. And then after saying that, he says that in verse 28. He just got done, he got done condemning whole cities of men, women, and children because they wouldn't repent. They, they saw his works, yet they wouldn't turn from their sin like this crowd. You give them the truth that they refuse to turn from their sin, he says, woe to you. It's going to be more tolerable for, the, for Sodom, the Sodomites that God burned to the ground in the Old Testament than for you. I just like, then he, they're, they're then he gives them the good hope of, hey, come to me. Yeah, and we, that's why we do both. There's always the but. I feel like yes, but, if you stay in this sin, you're going to be burned just like Sodom. But come to me. Oh, you there. And that's what we do. We give them both. We give them the bad news and then we say, but you don't have to go to hell. God loves you enough to where he's willing to forgive you, but you have to turn from it. You know what I mean? That's why we do both because that's what Jesus did. So um, hopefully that kind of helps. But. Yeah, I understand. I just wish that but was more emphasized. Well, it is. Like, it is. But there is hope. But yeah, I, you can do but I do that a lot. <laughs> I really do. Now, listen, we, 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 we have to get our beliefs from the Bible. So even like with Jonah, all right, God told Jonah, go into that city and, and tell them what I tell you. Jonah goes into the city and says, God is screaming it out loud. God is going to destroy this city in 40 days. That was it. There was no but. It was like, it sounded like a done deal. And we know that the king of that city took heed. And the people feared God. And they were like, oh man, maybe we can, maybe we can stop our sinning and God will show us mercy. God didn't even tell him that, that he would. He said, I will destroy you in 40 days. 
But they humbled themselves and turned away from their sin. It says in verse 10, Jonah 3.10, and it says God saw their works and God repented of the calamity he said he would do to them. So God saw what they were doing and was like, you know what? I'm going to honor that. I think, I think that's a little bit of a different situation because the people they, that were going to be destroyed knew of God. Not the Ninevites. I'm not saying they didn't know of God whatsoever, but this wasn't this wasn't the Israelites. So, well, everybody knows of God, though. Romans chapter 1 makes it very clear that we all understand that there is a God. But we hold the truth, not all of us, but many, most of the world, they hold the truth, meaning they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They, they try to convince themselves there's no God because they love their sin. That's what it's saying. So Romans 1 makes it clear you're without excuse because the invisible attributes of God is clearly seen. You know, the creation testifies to God, your conscience testifies to God. You know, so they're without excuse. I think everybody, not everybody, but most people have the wrong image of Jesus and God. So I think it's kind of hard. Like it's hard yeah, they of, might not have heard of Jesus, but they at least they know there is a God. It's hard to compare the situation with Jonah to like a situation like this. I feel like it's kind of like comparing apples to oranges. Well, I, well no, it's not. I mean, it, I mean, think about it. We're, we're at least giving them good hope. If I came out here and I just gave bad news, you're on. You all are on your way to hell, and that's all I said. That is true. If you're in your sin, well, I wouldn't say all. So let me correct that. If I went and I said, if you're still a sinner, you're on your way to hell. Is that true? Yes. If that's all I said, I'm not wrong. It's still true. And that's basically, I mean, that's bad news. No doubt about it. And that's all that Jonah gave them, bad news. And sometimes Jesus, he didn't always give good news when he was preaching. Sometimes it was bad news. But if you truly want the truth, you're going to do what you do. You would come up and be like, well, what do you mean by that, Jesus? I thought Jesus mostly only gave bad news to those who already... Well, not, not just them. If you look at J uh, John chapter 8, in fact, actually John chapter 6, if you go to John chapter 6, all right, he just got done feeding these people. Sin uh, just a bunch of sinners, right? They were following. I'm not saying they were all sinners. I don't know that. But he just got done feeding thousands of people, right? And then they follow him across. They end up going across the sea, right? And he starts telling them. Um, it, you can kind of read it, but if you start verse 26, he tells them, you don't seek me because you seek me not because you saw the miracles, because you, but because you did eat the loaves and were filled. And he tells them, don't labor for the meat that perishes, but for that meat which endures to everlasting life. Notice it says, notice he tells you, you have to labor for it. So he actually rebukes them. He sits there and tells them, like, look, man, you're only following me because I did good stuff for you. That's a rebuke. And he says, don't labor for that stuff. Labor for what I want to give you everlasting life. And then he goes on and he says very hard things. Uh, let's skip down to... I'm just skipping to save some time. Uh, all right, right. All right, so verse 53, I'm just trying to save some time. You Read it later. I would encourage you to do that. It says, Then Jesus said unto them, verse 53, Verily, verily, this isn't like just fair, this is thousands of people. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me, and I in him. Now, listen to how they respond to that. He sits there, it sits there and says, uh, verse 60, many therefore of his disciples these are his followers. They're believing in Jesus. This isn't just his 12. He had many disciples, right? Okay. It says, many therefore, verse 60, many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? 
When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? Notice they're, they're, they're in their feelings. That didn't feel good. It sounds like a cannibal. And that, just like today, they're in their feelings. And, he's, and he literally says, Does this offend you? Does this bother your feelings? Does this not make you feel good? Let's see how Jesus responds after that. Verse 62. What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It's the Spirit that quickeneth, meaning gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Verse 64. But there are some of you that believe not. And he knew who wouldn't believe him. Verse 65. Jesus says, Therefore said I unto you, that no man can come to me except it were given unto him of my Father. Verse 66. Here's where I wanted to get. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. He pushed them all away. If I did that, you'd be like, dude, why are you pushing them all away? Well, he's just giving them truth. It's up to them what they're going to do with it. Now look at what he says. He's not finished yet. He goes to verse 67. or I'm, uh, Verse 67 it says, Then Jesus said unto the twelve, his twelve apostles that he picked, he turns to them and says, You want to go away also? Dude, that sounds, that sounds hard. Like they all, they, thousands just forsook him. And then he sits there and turns to 12 like, hey, you guys want to leave too? There you go. Go with him. And it says, then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, where shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So he, he, he refuted that with Jesus. He's like, no, I'm not going anywhere, Jesus. Even if I don't quite understand what you just said, you have the words of life. I mean, that's hard. That's John 6. You could read this later too, the whole chapter of John chapter 8, when there was a whole bunch of Jews that believed in Jesus. They, this isn't just Pharisees that were rejecting Jesus. These are just regular people, regular Israelites, and it says they believed in Jesus. And Jesus is saying, you are my disciples if you do what I say, if you obey me. What do you mean if? You know? And he started rebuking the crowds, the Pharisees, along with some of the Jews, like, you guys, you're of your father the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning. You know, I mean, these are hard words that he preached. Now, that doesn't apply to everybody, right? I'm not saying everybody there was like that. And it's just like when we preach, you know, so... What I would really encourage you to do is really just slow down when you read the Gospels. Slow down, take your time, read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and just see how Jesus interacted with people. Now, there's times he was very graceful, like I'm being with you, because he's dealing with somebody that will listen to him. Like the woman in John 4, the Samaritan woman that was at the well, and his apostles left, and Jesus sat down with her, and he said, you know, she was getting water out of the well, and he said, you need to go for the, I'm paraphrasing, you need to have the water that springs up into everlasting life. And of course, that's figurative, the Holy Spirit giving us everlasting life. And she says, where is this water that I can drink of it and never thirst again? And he's pointing them, her to him like, I'm not one. And then she goes on and says, well, I know the Messiah when he comes is going to lead us into all truth. And he says, it is he. It's he who you're talking to. How does she respond to that? She ran into the, the town and started preaching out loud. I met him. I met him. And they came to him. I think it's interesting. But she was, she was delicate. She, was, she wasn't like, like in John chapter 8 and John chapter 6 where they didn't want to believe in Jesus because he said something hard. She was willing to receive it. But go ahead. I was just going to say it's interesting that like with Jesus, you know, people listen to him because he spoke with authority. Like not, yeah, just the, not just the preacher, but right. somebody with authority. And so I feel like comp comparing that to this, it's kind of hard because we never truly know if somebody will listen or not. Like, no, you're right. And I All like, I can do is see the outward manifestation. I don't know it. Now, you typically the inside will manifest on the outside like them over there. They're being a little loud and boisterous. I don't know exactly what's in the heart, but we do know it's manifesting and they're being crass. Okay? Um, but that's, 
I don't have the authority like Jesus does, obviously. But that's why I quote Jesus, so they can see who the real Jesus is. Because I don't want them to see me. I don't even want them to remember me when I leave. Yeah, I pass out gospel tracts that has my information on it. Because if they look at my preaching, they look at the, the, uh, the sermons I give, it's all about the Bible. I want to point them to Jesus. I don't I don't want them to even know who I am. I don't care. Like, I don't care about that garbage. I want them to know Jesus. You know, so yeah, you're right. We don't we, obviously none of us have the authority of Jesus. But here's a here's a difficult Bible verse for you though. First Corinthians chapter six, verse two. It says that the saints will judge the world. I'm sorry. First Corinthians chapter six, verse two. Remember we were reading the end of First Corinthians five? If you keep reading verses one through three in the next chapter, right after those verses we read, it sits there and says that the saints, which are Christians, will judge the world. I don't know how that works. I mean, obviously, only God, Jesus has the authority to cast in hell, but in some way, we're involved in this judgment. I don't know how. It just says that the saints will judge the world. And if we will judge the world, shouldn't we be able to judge in the smallest matters between ourselves? You know? You could also think of it, I don't know, because it doesn't say it explicitly. I don't know if it means like, well, he says, the saints in heaven, or does it say, well, there is, there, yeah, there, there, well, so all, if you're in Christ and you're truly following him, you're not sinning, you're a saint. If you but, want, if you want me to prove that, did I'll show you. Did the uh, verse say saints on heaven or the saints? Well, saint, yeah, I, for sure. When you die, if you die in the faith, you weren't in sin, you're following Jesus. Yeah, you're a saint when you die. But saints are on earth too, and I'll prove it with the Bible. Um, how, then my question, I guess, would be: How would you know if someone truly is a saint? Because Jesus only, only God knows. You know? Well, you'll, Jesus said in Matthew, when you read. Uh, uh, starting in chapter 5, chapter 6, he said, you'll know a tree by its fruit. So if I go up to this, uh, if I go up to this tree behind you, let's pretend it's, let's pretend it's bearing apples. It's an apple tree. Apple tree, right. It tells me it's an apple tree. If I go up and there's bananas on it, I'm not going to be like, wow, look at that apple tree. There you go. So you'll know a tree by its fruit. So like, I, I spoke to somebody earlier that was coming against me and they claimed that I think they were a Christian and they dropped the F-bomb in front of me and immediately I was like, you're no, not a Christian. I, answer, I mean, she didn't even like drop the F-bomb like, oh, I'm so sorry I did that, blah, blah, No, she dropped it and didn't care. And it's like, and then she blasphemed God. I'm like, you're not a Christian. You're deceived. So you'll know a tree by its fruit. You know, uh, and Jesus said, a good tree bears good fruit. An evil tree bears corrupt fruit. So what about when someone is converted from being a non-believer to a believer? Mm -hmm. Does it mean that like they, I guess they changed it to a different tree? Or? Yeah, 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 right. Yeah, you literally, you're, you literally, so if you really want the picture of it, Jesus in John chapter 15 talks about the fact that you're a branch. Okay, you can follow along, but I'll, you can remember this later, John chapter 15, verses 1 through 10, the vine and the branches, if you know what I'm talking about. Jesus said that he is the true vine, and his father is the vine dresser, meaning the father's the one that prunes or cuts the branches, right? And he says, we are the branches. And every branch that is in him, in Jesus, this is a Christian. Every branch that is in him, if it doesn't produce good fruit, the father takes away which shows you, you can be cut off from Jesus. And he says that, you know, if you're abiding in him, you produce good fruit and the father prunes you that you produce more, meaning you're growing, not sinning less over time, but you grow in more knowledge and, and the new knowledge that comes in, you obey it. Right? Reading your Bible, God speaking to you, you know what I mean? Um, Roman, Romans chapter 11, the Apostle Paul said basically the same thing. He says, uh, when he talks about the Jews and Gentiles, he says that we are grafted in. As branches, we're grafted into Israel. And we become partaker of that rootstock, which is Jesus. So... Yeah, it, you literally, you go from, he, he, in fact, he sits there and says, the wild olive tree, you were a different tree, and he takes you off that tree, the wild tree, and he grafts you into Israel, and you become of Christ. So it's not like, I wouldn't say like a new tree, but he takes you off the wicked tree 
the sinners of the world and grafts you into the vine of the true Israel of God, which is the people of God. That, that analogy makes more sense than the tree because right. you right. can't just like be a new tree. Right, right. But but he does. We know this. Second Corinthians five. It says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Right. Old things have passed away. Behold, all has become new. So we do become new in Christ. But yeah, we're grafted in. You got the the wild olive tree, which is the people of the world. And, he's, and it says that if you were grafted off from the wild tree and you were grafted in to the cultivated olive tree that is not you by nature, meaning we were not of Israel, he grafts you in. Don't boast against the branches that fell off. The Israelites that don't believe in Jesus as their Messiah, those branches fell off. He says, don't boast against them. If God didn't spare those Jews that wouldn't believe in Jesus, he won't spare us either. And it says, therefore consider the goodness and severity of God. On those who fell, severity. But towards us, goodness, if we continue in his goodness. See, that's a condition. You know, and he says, otherwise you also will be cut off. We can be cut off from Jesus if we won't repent. Yeah, if you sin and you refuse to repent, in your sin, you have no relationship with God. The only thing he will hear from you, if you, if you do, not when, get, I'm not saying you think this, but don't ever think, well, I'm going to sin. I can't help it. You're already defeated in your mind. The war starts in the mind. You know, so have the mentality of, I can do all things through Jesus who's Strengthens me. That's Philippians 4:13. All things. It's, it's hard because. Oh, it, I'm not saying it's not. It's <laughs> not, not like it's hard to kind of have that mindset because everybody sins. Everybody has sinned. Not everybody does sin. That's true. Right, right. Like, like, like I have sinned in the past, like, and, but right now I have no sin in my life. The blood of Jesus has cleansed me from all my sin, right. and I'm perfect in Christ right now. Right. That doesn't mean I'll remain perfect. Mm -hmm. If I do commit a willful sin mm -hmm. against God, I'm no longer perfect, and I'm cut off from Christ. Right. Yeah, I understand because um, sometimes the wording can be like a little deceiving. I know. That's why I got to explain it because somebody hears perfect and they think you're saying you never sinned. No, I didn't say that. Yeah. You can't be perfect like Jesus. Jesus never sinned. However, you can be perfect from this day forward if you turn away from your sin, turn in faith to Jesus. 1 John 1, 7 says, Jesus' blood cleanses you from all sin. Right. I guess it's, it's better to explain it as like, I have sinned. And I do. I have right. sinned before. Right. I have sinned before. Right. I knew Jesus. I have sinned right. before I knew Jesus. But as of right now, right. I will try to continue. You, you're right. Without right. And you have to have the mentality of not even try. But I truly believe that I'll never sin again willfully against God as long as as I trust in Jesus and I follow him. Now, I don't know for certain if I'll ever sin again. I can't predict the future. I could, but I do believe without any doubt that I can never sin again as long as I remain in Jesus. I guess you could almost say it as like, I want to not sin. Well, I, I really believe I'll never sin again, but I, that doesn't mean that I you know. can't. It doesn't mean I, I know. Like, I, I know this. Like, you don't know. Like, only God knows. I don't know, but I don't want to sin again. I, right. I and do everything in my power along with this. That's what he wants. God. Right. You cannot do this in your own strength. Yeah. You do it in the power of Jesus. I'm telling you, man, this works. I used to lust all the time, man. And every time I was tempted with it, I immediately, I don't care if it's 500,000 times a day, I called out to Jesus immediately. And now it's like most sin, most temptations of sin and all that is like nothing to me. It works. Now, like I said, I'm not speaking of sins of ignorance. You could have something in your life right now that's sin to God, but it's not sin to you. You're not going to equally with like everybody, right? Like even well, yourself. no, I don't know that. I don't know that. I'm going to give you a Bible verse to show that. Go to John chapter nine real quick, because I want I don't want you to just believe me. I want you to see what Jesus says. John chapter nine, I believe it's starting in verse thirty five. As soon as I get there. Um, let's see. Let's go down. Let's start in verse thirty nine. Remember, I read that to you earlier about, do you believe on the Son of God? I think I read that to you. Anyways, verse 39. And Jesus said, for judgment I am coming to the world that they which 
see might not sit or I'm sorry that they which see not might see meaning those that don't see might see mm -hmm. all right I'm reading King James yeah uh, and that and that they which see might be made blind okay some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said to him are we blind also now is he speaking of a physical blindness no okay verse 41 Verse 41, Jesus says, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say we see, therefore your sin remains. So what he's saying is, look, he's not speaking of physical blindness. He's saying if you don't have any idea that you're in a sin right now, you have no sin. <laughs> but if you claim, hey, I see it now. Like if I come to you and I'm like, look, man, you're in error. You're in a sin right now. And you're like, oh, man, I didn't know. See, now you see because I showed you. And now you need to humble yourself because now you are a sinner because you have knowledge. Oh, wow, I was in the sin. I had no idea. Now you need to repent, confess it to God, turn away from it, and obey him. And God understands, and he'll forgive you. Now, willful sin, that's different. Willful sin, you have full knowledge of what you're doing, but you do it anyways. You know, like you know, like you know not to have sex outside of marriage. Well, if you're just like, I'm going to do it anyways, that's a willful sin. If you die in that sin, you go to hell. You know, you, 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 can't, you can't commit willful sin and have fellowship with God. If you're in a sin of ignorance, Jesus says you have no sin. So, I know that's a lot, man, but, hope, but I always back it up with Bible. Because I, I want you to see that. That's what I do when I preach. I want to show people this is what God says. Not me. Right. If it's my opinion, I'm going to say my opinion. Because I want to preface that. Like, everything I'm telling you, I'm going to give an account for that to God, man. That, that's terrifying. But I fear God and I love God. And I want you to know the truth, and I back it up with the Word of God. I give it to you. This is what Jesus says. So. Yeah, man. Well, you you understand things better, right? Right. But see, your spirit your spirit receives it. And really, a lot of conversations I've had, a lot of people did receive it. Now they might not agree with it, but they were like you listening, and and they would talk about how they felt about something, but. The thing with feelings is feelings are deceptive. It doesn't matter how I feel. It doesn't matter how you feel. The question is, is it true? And if it's truth, my feelings are irrelevant because it's true. You know, so, and I know this generation, they're really in their feelings. You know, but I mean, the truth is the truth, no matter what. That's because we don't believe in Jesus. Yeah. If you want to ask, I can talk to you. I feel like kind of just going all the way back to the beginning about you know the sign being a little bit right. out there. Right. I feel like that, like what we're doing right now, mm -hmm. I feel like it could be effective with other people. Who right. Don't yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I've been doing that most of the day. Yeah. And yeah. I feel like I'm just trying. It's just hard to find. Like, oh, I know. To like. And, and look, I'm man, be so God may not be calling you to street preach, okay? I mean, I, I and, wanna... and, and, and God may call, uh, maybe he does call you to street preach. Maybe next time I'm here, I don't know when it'll be. It may, it may be a long time from now. Maybe he wants you to just come out here and have one-on-ones with people. Um, then again, God may use you to just do one-on-ones with people. I'm not saying that's wrong. Now, we're using the most biblical method of open-air preaching, calling people to repent, uh, but it's certainly perfectly fine to have one-on-ones and not do any of this. Just go around and give them the gospel, tell them the truth, show them what Jesus had to say, and that's perfectly fine, right? As long as we're evangelizing because we love people and we care for them to tell them the truth, that's what matters. We can't change anybody. You know, we can't force anybody to change. All we can do is just tell them the truth. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, it's just kind of hard with the sign being out there. Right. But I feel like I feel like it deters people versus I think having these conversations. Well, I mean, really, the opposite happens. Uh, in all my experience, this stuff, they don't. It's like they don't leave, man. Yesterday, I was at Kent State. It was almost eight hours. And and most of the time we had a crowd. It's like they wouldn't they wouldn't leave. I don't whatever it is, man. If the word of God's on the signs and it draws them in. And the Holy Spirit does his job to convict. Them. 
Right. You know, so I, I mean, the signs just draw people in. Now, I, I do believe, like I've preached, maybe once or twice without signs. I think I, I might. I've, I've said that several times. That I think, I think I've preached without signs, and obviously I preach with signs all the time now, and it's because the signs work. Like without the signs, it's like I don't. Know, it just doesn't get as much attention. Even if you changed up the signs, do you think it wouldn't be as effective? Well, I mean, the thing is, well, I mean, even the good news. It sounds like bad news to them. No sinners in the kingdom of God. Um, but the thing is, they it's it's like that cancer analogy. They have to understand what to turn from. I can't just make it general. Even Jesus didn't do that. He would call out people's sin. Okay, so that's what we see with God in the Bible. He calls out people's sins, and He uses other men to do it. Um, so they have to understand what to turn from. If they don't understand that they have basically like that cancer analogy, if I come to you and I'm like, dude, you got cancer all through your body, take this medicine, you'd be like, dude, no, I don't, get out of here. But if I come to you with evidence, evidence, and I'm like, dude, you've got cancer, man, drink this. So now it's gonna make sense to you, all right, dude, give it to me. So instead of like displaying all of these like, sinners do you think it would be effective to just show them the straight up evidence like straight up bible yeah, verses that say yeah yeah and i do yeah, yeah like when i'm holding the signs i'll like preach and i'll literally quote mm -hmm. you know like first corinthians 6 9. i feel like putting up verses would be more effective than just well uh Oh, I'm, well, I actually have banners that literally have Bible verses on it. Yeah, because I feel like this just kind of but I mean, once people out. Right, but I mean, once again, it's truth. There's nothing wrong with it. It's truth. It don't make people feel good all the time, but Jesus didn't make people feel good either. So as long as it's truth, it's not wrong. You know, and it's true. The motive of our hearts is you have to understand this stuff is killing you, man. It's sending you to hell. Now, like I said, I've got a... A banner we actually brought with us, but I don't think we brought it here today. It's in the car, I think, but it has, it actually has Bible verses on it. Um, so, yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you can hold a sign with Bible verses on it. You can hold a sign with just the bad news on it. You can hold a sign with just the good news. I'm not even saying that's wrong. However, what I would say is it would be wrong to just go around and go, God loves you, like the woman behind me, God loves all. That's not even the, that's not the whole truth. Psalm 5 5 says she don't know what she's talking about. Psalm 5 5 says God hates all workers of iniquity. God hates sinners. Well, I mean, God doesn't love all. Now, He loves all in the sense He died for them. It says, for God so loved. Right. And God demonstrates His love towards us in that while we were sinners, not still are. So these people walk around, they just think God just loves them. God just loves them. And we're hateful. And it's like, they don't, they're idolaters. A lot of them are. They don't even know who Jesus is. They think Jesus was a big old teddy bear that walked around like a long haired white man hippie. Just, I love you guys so much, man. Just believe in me and you're saved no matter what. And that's just not the Jesus of the Bible, you know? So um, this kind of gives them a wake up call. But once again, they have to understand I know it's certain sins and it's the most common ones at colleges, but they have to know it. They have to know it so they understand the antidote is right here, Jesus. So. I understand. You, you live around here. Um, I have an apartment over, yeah, 15 oh, okay. minutes away from campus. But yeah. I grew up in Cleveland. Oh, Cleveland, okay. Oh, you may have ran, ran into some preachers up there. Um, I, have you ever seen preachers before? I mean, do they come here a lot or? Yeah. Kind really, of. Akron? Really? Not, I, I wouldn't say like a lot, like every day, all day. But they, it's like at least once a week I see preachers out here. All right. Well, that's good. I, I don't know if they're doing it the right way or not. I don't know. That's between them and God. I don't know them probably, but I, I can only represent me and my fellowship. So, I mean, there are some that do it wrong, but, you know, if they're given the truth, maybe it's in a wrong way. If they're given the truth, it's still the truth. Um, but I, I try. To, I always make sure I want to balance it. Right. You know, they got it. They got it. They have to know the hope. But I mean, let's face it. Like most people, 
they 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 believe God loves them. Yeah, and when you tell them, man, well, but Psalm five five says God hates all workers of iniquity. Psalm seven eleven says that God is angry with the wicked every day, and it's like shock to them. Like, you know, they don't even understand. They're like, it's, they're flabbergasted because they, they probably never heard that. Before. So. Sometimes I just see the sign and I'm like, yeah. I agree with that right. being the best way. But I guess we agree or disagree. As long, well, what I would say is, if it's truth, it's not wrong. Mm -hmm. I just, I'm not saying like you're wrong. Right, right, right. I, I, just, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not getting into the gen, gen. I'm not making funny. I'm, I'm not doing the generation thing of well, you know, I'm not saying you're wrong, but. What I'm telling you is, you, you need to put your thinking with the Bible. If it's true what's on the sign, um, okay, my sign's coming down. If it's true, if it's true what the sign says, you know what I mean? I don't know why that was dropped. Oh, it's in there, somebody did this wrong. If it's true what the sign says, oh, that's why, because he's got a screw. Um, if it's true what the sign says, you know, if it's true what the sign says, it's still true. You know what I mean? So, yeah, that's all we can do. This actually isn't my sign. This is the other brothers. <laughs> Harold's for the King is uh, his YouTube channel. He's got a YouTube channel also, Harold's for the King. Uh, they're actually from Georgia. Yeah. Yeah, I, was, I noticed with them too, it's just with these two brothers. Um, they get they were louder they get angry well the bible says in ephesians 4 be angry and sin not so anger in and of itself is not a sin now i'm not going to say they were angry they were pro what i saw is they were raising their voice and the reason why is like when they're like right now talking but if somebody starts getting loud and voiceless, like blah, 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 then you have to raise your voice so you can be heard. And we're we're told to do that to preach, to proclaim. And if somebody's like being wicked and all that stuff, we're gonna call that out. We're gonna rebuke that sharply. Um, but if they're just talking, see, they're talking. Now. What I saw earlier is people yelling at them, so they're gonna yell back so they can be heard. We're out in the open air. You know what I mean? Um, so, I mean, there's times that you'll see me do that, even on my channel you'll see that but i'll have conversations with people like you and go at it for a while you know i just feel like in my opinion yeah i don't think it's like really good to yell at people so harshly i'm sorry to interrupt but you guys have been uh, talking for a really long time yeah, 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 what's yeah. the current topic we're on well I just just going back and forth about stuff yeah just talking You're, about like like what's like the current topic like what's like the specific yeah. topic? I, I think we were kind of wrapping it up yeah. i think I mean, he was just giving me his opinion and yeah and i just said look our as a christian our opinions come from the bible so it's not about our feelings it's about what the truth is so yeah. that's it yeah we're just at a pass there and that's all I would encourage you yeah. to do. Just read the Gospels, man. Yeah, and, 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 and if it's true, mm -hmm. doesn't matter how people feel. It doesn't even matter how I feel if it's true. Because I'm going to stand before God. You know? So that's all I would leave you with, man. Yeah. All right? Yeah, I feel like we thanks are, for talking to me. Man. All right? we're, we're both Christians, and I feel like we're just... You might do it a slightly different way, man. I'm not going to sit there and fault you for that. As long as you're giving them the truth. Right. That you got to turn from your sin and turn to faith to Jesus. Right. As long as we have that. that right. Core, yeah. Why not? Right. I'm not going to sit there and be like, oh, you're doing it. I'm not going to do that, man. Yeah. Right? So. Yeah, man. You're welcome. Yeah, I just. I don't know. I get very deep into conversation with. Dude, you ain't bothering, man. That's what I'm here yeah. for, man. I, it's, it's very nice to just be able right. to get deep into scripture. Right. And, the reasons why and if you like scripture that much if you check out the channel and my sermons dude it's scripture 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 uh -huh. it's a lot of that. in fact it gets kind of tedious but it's like you know what i don't care it's the word of god and i'm gonna preach i think, I think sometimes that's what people need to hear most it's right. just like straight up scripture right let that speak to you because romans 10 says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of god 
It's not my opinion. It's what God says. Right. And you can see, like, the whole time we've been talking, even before you got here, it's like they don't leave, man. Yeah. You know? And, and that's why, I mean, that's why we use the signs. They don't leave. Now, eventually some leave, and then some more come in. I mean, we'll probably, I don't even know what time it is right now. It's like 3. 3.30 almost. Because from here, we're actually, um, we're actually going to head home. I live outside of Zanesville, and then tomorrow we're going to Columbus State. I took the week off. CSU or Columbus? S Columbus State University in Columbus, Ohio. Yeah. Uh, we'll go there tomorrow because I took the week off from work. And then the last, uh, let's see, Thursday we'll go to uh, Ohio University Athens. And they're, they're really rowdy down there. I was down there one time and got assaulted. Now, I'm not saying the dude punched me. But started shoving me around, threw his liquid on me. And, you know, I just loved him back. Somebody, I think, came and kind of got him off of me. So, you got a question, man? Okay. It's amazing to think that, right? It's amazing that, that, that a man is telling you that I don't love that man. I just want you guys to like, so you make sure you stick to scripture, right? right. I, I notice with, with... I do, uh, man. Like, yeah. if... I, if yeah, with right, if... Sure. if I'm not telling you, but if you feel led to check out my channel, like you will see times I strongly rebuke people. And when I preach, I don't know if you were here when I was open air preaching, I sound like a, a military drill sergeant. My voice is, whatever reason, when I preach out loud, it sounds very militant, like a, like a drill instructor. Uh, but you know, when, I, when I'm preaching, this is what I do. I'll, I'll open air preach for a while, especially at colleges. We get in a lot of conversations and this is how I am with people. Yeah, we have one-on-ones and I've talked to many people, man, and, and I've had many good conversations and all, all you can do is give them the truth, pray for them afterwards, right? And uh, it's up to them what they do from, from there, you know, so. Yeah, I just want you to check with your brothers this time because yeah. yeah, sometimes, yeah, like you said, they get a little, like, raise their voices and intensity. Yeah, that kind of yeah. yeah, I just want, I, like, I disagree with that, but right. even, not even speaking about, like, right, right, right. With raising their voice, I just want them to stick to scripture. Right, right. Yeah, I, that's, that's exactly why, like, I preach Bible verses. Because I am nothing, right? We're nothing. We're just, we're just men, right? It's God, what he has to say, not what I have to say. Even everything I told you to do, that's why I'm telling you, like, be a Berean. Don't just blindly believe it. Look at it yourself. All the Bible verses I gave you, check it out yourself. Read it. Study it thoroughly. Um, because we're all going to stand before you. you know? So, usually the ones that I'll come the strongest against, I actually, I would say, in my opinion, I think I probably come, I probably give strongest rebukes to the hypocrite Christians. I dealt with one yesterday at Kent State. He kept arguing with me that basically, he believes in once saved, always saved. I think he's really new. I, he's not even a Christian, and I could tell by his fruit. He basically said that, like, we sin all the time, and then he's, like, contradicting himself from what I remember. Uh, and I kept giving him Bible verses, Bible verses, Bible verses, and I had a crowd around me, and I'm like, yeah, but look at what Jesus said in Revelation 3, 5. He says, I will not blot out his name from the book of life. Why would Jesus threaten that, hey, I won't take you out of the book of life? Why even say that if it's impossible to blot you out? That's stupid. I gave my son a car. He didn't earn the car, right? You didn't earn salvation. I gave my son a car. He didn't earn it. But if he got out of line, I can take it from him. It was a gift. The same with Jesus. I mean, Revelation 3, 5, he's rebuking a church. And he says, I will not blot out your name from the book of life if they repent. Why even say that if he can't do it? It makes no sense. And what he kept wanting to do is... I think it was his pastor. He kept playing videos of some dude talking about the Bible verse. And I'm like, stop it, dude. Deal with the Bible. He's talking about the Bible. No, that's a man. Go to the Bible. Doesn't matter what a man says. Go to the Bible. And he kept wanting to show me videos of some dude preaching about it. I'm like, no, go to the Bible. Because I agree with you. Give them the Word of God. And that's really what I try to aim to do. Man. Give them the Word of God.
the video, it's just hard because knowing you and now like being able to speak right. with you, I understand like why where you, I'm coming from. Why, All right. why you do this and, and look, man, I understand. I get it. You guys. You see the signs, and I know in this younger generation, you guys are kind of being taught like, don't don't hurt people's feelings. And I'm not saying I'm not speaking for you, just the generation as a whole. It's like don't offend people, don't hurt them. If you hurt their feelings, you don't like them. But Jesus hurt people's feelings. Now his intent wasn't to be like, I'm going to put you down. His intent was this is the truth, but you can be saved. You know, so. <laughs> well, if you, even if you stick around this crowd and listen, you'd learn a lot. Yeah, I understand. Because uh, you get all kinds of questions, man. Like right now, they're, I mean, like you can see they're rejecting it and he's just talking to them. So I got a tattoo. See, now he's giving his testimony. You know what I mean? So. If you want to come over here, I mean, listen. I don't like the fact that you Okay, can you give me a couple thousand dollars to get it removed? No, I'm just saying you're going to I love it. No, that's not what the Bible says. You're not God, and that's not what God says. If you repent. See, right now, what's going on with this a lot? This is called justifying. Okay, I'm covered in tattoos. I've got gang tattoos on my arm. I can't, I'm not spending thousands upon thousands of dollars to remove them. I've got kids to take care of other stuff. So I felt convicted by God wear long sleeve shirts. It don't matter how hot it is, if I'm outside, it's long sleeve shirts. Unless I happen to be like around my fellowship that knows me and I'll wear a t-shirt. But I've repented. I'm forgiven for that. I won't get tattoos any longer. And what she's doing is she may be part of the pride community, it sounds like. And she's trying to justify her sin by pointing out something in her. Like, oh, well, you got a tattoo. Yeah, but I was forgiven. Uh, what is it called? Ad hominem? You know yeah, right. Ad hominem. Right. Ad hominem attack is where you're calling somebody else a name. Now, I don't know if that's what she's doing, it's, it's but like she, name, but it's like just, really what she's doing is she's just like, like, oh, well, I see you got a tattoo. Yeah, but I've turned away from my sin and I don't do that anymore. Ad hominem. Yeah, but. Ad hominem is kind of like uh, attacking somebody else. For and their character. And, yeah, so I guess it could include that. And deflecting off the Right, it's a deflection. Right, right, exactly. And uh, it, it's it's just conviction, which is a good thing. It's actually, believe it or not, it's a good thing when somebody gets really mad at you because it shows their conscience is still working. I preach all over, and and I go to concerts in this state, like Ohio State and all that. And these old people walk past me, and they're just like, they don't even care, dude. Because they've been sinning for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, and sin hardens the heart. The longer you continue in your sin, the harder your heart gets. And eventually, you don't care anymore. Whereas when you're still young, yeah, you've probably been sinning a lot. I'm not speaking of you. But a lot of these people have probably been sinning a lot, but they're not totally hardened to the point that it's not breaking through. They don't have a heart of stone. Not yet. Some of them do, but not yet. Even like the homosexual community and the LGBT, you know, all that, they get very angry. Why are you getting angry? I want you to be saved. You know, I'm giving you the truth that you can have salvation. I mean, I literally know a dude that, that was a homosexual. He just got married to a woman. God totally changed him. I know a dude that, that was transgender, dressing like a straight woman, man. And God changed him. He's now living like a man, and he's preaching the gospel. You know, so God changes people from the inside. Preach the gospel and glorify God, first and foremost. Yeah. And then we hope, just like when Jesus was able to sow or spread the seed. Yeah, you're fine. Three, right. Three yeah, rounds like rejected it. When somebody comes so and attacks us, the faith. Right. But we can't control if they receive if we're going to lead by example. That's a right. We don't react in the way that you are. As long as you don't react in the flesh. Now, you can rebuke. There's times, even when I'm preaching, if somebody's really, really bad, you, especially the professing Christian, we all sin every day, blank you, blah, blah, blah. and I'm like, you're a wicked sinner on your way to hell. And you won't, and I had another person, I've had people walk by like, I can't wait to get to hell, woo, 
And I'm like, okay, well then dump gasoline on yourself and light yourself on fire. That sounds really mean. But that's the same kind of stuff Jesus said in a roundabout way. That he's going to cast you into a furnace of fire. And what I'm trying to show them is you don't mean what you're saying. You're, you're a verbal hypocrite. I feel like they don't know. How do you know? How do you know? Poor gas can like, Sound me. You can't blankets cover everybody. You know, some homosexuals do. Well, yeah, but once again, I'm not saying you have to say that. What I'm saying is, like Jesus. I mean, think about it. When Jesus in Matthew 13, 41, I gave us to you before, Jesus said he's going to gather out of his kingdom all those that offend and those that are still sinning, work in iniquity, and cast them into a furnace of fire. Right. Well, would you tell Jesus, well, Jesus, you could leave out the fire part. Just tell them that they, they, they won't be in heaven. I feel like See what I'm saying? Like it's a mean thing. I feel like mentioning, or, like, you're going to, if you continue this, you're going to go to hell. I would leave like, it. That's not, I would don't think that's wrong. It's kind of just like aggressively saying, like, oh, well, if that's the case, then just like yourself. Yeah, get, what I'm getting at is get the party started. And it sounds mean, but I model my preaching from Jesus. I feel like it would be better to say, like, if you... In some instances, it, it could be. If, like, it, you could we like, just believe in the Bible. If you die tomorrow, like you don't really mean this, because right. if you die tomorrow, you will be sent to a furnace of fire. Right. Right. Yeah, I, yeah, right, right. 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 So, like, approaching that, that's, right. that's how. I'm right, and that, that's fine. Because that's literally what Jesus said. Because um, saying like, like you just set yourself. It sounds. Like, it's just. I tell you what, it gets their attention. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it gets their attention, but, uh, and it works to get it to sink in. Yeah. You don't, and you. Yeah. Like, I don't know how often I do it, but I may tell them, like, see, you're a verbal hypocrite. You really don't mean what you just said. You don't want to be lit on fire. And then I'll usually tell them, if they're walking away, I'll be like, but Jesus cares for you. He doesn't want you to go there. If you turn away from your sin, you don't have to go there. So I don't even leave them hanging. I usually tell them, but you don't have to go there. You don't have to be lit on fire. You don't have to go to the furnace of fire. You know, so I give them that hope that, look, man, you don't mean what you just said. You're trying to look like a tough guy before everybody. I'll give you an example. There, there was a, a few, there was like three youth, I think, in the beginning that were mocking me. And I called them out kind of, I kind of, I rebuked them for that. I called them strong. I, I can't remember what I said, but it was, I called. I believe I called him out for it and I was like I I saw him chuckling over on the side and I was like you won't be a tough guy when you die all that tough guy stuff is out the window when you stand before God you ain't gonna have all your buddies dude guess what those same guys that I spoke mean to they came and had a long conversation with me. and I, if my memory serves me correctly because it looked like the guy I'm thinking of um, if it was the same guy he I had a conversation and it was a conversation you know like he was cordial you know so I just I basically do what God's leading me to do um, of course I base it on the Bible um, but like like what he's doing right now conversation because this guy's spirit is me you know what I mean he's listening what's that when you just said that, so for example, went to my head. Oh, I've done okay. this initially. Oh, right. 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 <laughs> You're fine, man. Basically, my memory is not very good, dude. That's why I know it's a gift of God that he gave me to preach his word, because my memory is not good, dude. Basically, I think the verse was this. And everybody's like, what is he saying? The spirit. Something about the spirit not being, like, a word yet. Something. I don't know. He's just, I remember the ideas of certain chapters and verses. But I know. My question, too, is what you're doing. How come, a good thing how come to do too, man, is you can take your Bible. I'm not telling you have to, but you can highlight stuff to really stand out. Right? Oh, okay. There you go. Yeah. Right, right. Okay, good. Yeah, we get a we get a lot of this. I mean. Right, right, right. And, and I mean, we. I don't know if you was here when I was open air preaching, but dude, it sounded aggressive because my voice is very loud.
mouth. And it drew, now, this brother actually, I think, preached first. It started drawing, he got me, a, he got a crowd started. I started preaching and it got a lot. Like a bunch of them flooded out of there because they heard my voice all the way down there. And they started flooding over. And since then, it's mainly been this. You know, that usually happens all the time. We start open air preaching, holding the signs, draw a crowd, then you start one-on-ones. Or it might be one-on-threes or something, you know, so. Or a little round of, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just the way the reality. You know what I mean? They're convicted. And and I know it sounds like crazy, but it's actually a... I would much rather people be exceedingly angry than not even care whatsoever. I'll, I'll answer. Just let me finish. I'd rather them be exceedingly angry than just be apathetic. Because then that's telling me, like, their, their conscience, they probably don't even... They, they probably don't even care anymore. And that's a dangerous place to be in. You know what I mean? So. He wrote a lot against Jews and stuff. That's why. And then, uh, I, I'm not a Protestant. I have a question. So, like, so like, if, so like, if a Christian, so if a Christian, so, so does that mean like if you get tattoos? So it's a sin. So you can't, you shouldn't get tattoos. I got family. I got tattoos. All I got gang stuff on me, man. But I don't do that anymore. I've repented of that. Right. I stopped it. I turned away from it. And and my personal conviction. I'm not saying you have to do this. I was convicted by God because it's so wicked to wear long sleeves to cover them up because like I got gang banging stuff on this arm I got satanic stuff and like it's evil stuff so I'm not saying you have to do that that's my conviction so yeah I'm, yeah, I'm a Christian but I was just wondering like so, so I shouldn't get a tattoo like if you're convicted you shouldn't get a I, I definitely would advise not to get a tattoo um, because really you're, re remember it says in first that's first Corinthians chapter 3 that your body is the temple of God so would you go up like let's pretend this building is the temple of God would you go up and graffiti it so I would advise not to do that even if you got tattoos of like verses or yeah I, I still wouldn't advise I'm, I'm I'm not going to dogmatically say like you're definitely sinning if you put a bible verse on you but here's the thing like number one what's the motive of your heart why are you doing it now look in the Old Testament, God didn't want you marking up your body because that's what the heathen of the world do. Now, we're not under that law, but there are things from that law that are still moral and relevant today. So I'm not going to dogmatically say like, well, I want to get a Bible verse um, on my upper part of my arm, but nobody's ever going to see it but me. I'm not showing off like, look at this dude. I'm so awesome. You know, that's pride. God hates pride. So let's say maybe you tattoo a little Bible verse up here nobody will really ever see it maybe except your wife you're not showing it off and the intent of your heart is pure okay I'm not gonna say you're sinning but I'd really be like but why like the Word of God should be in your heart not on your skin you wouldn't go graffiti the temple of God you know and really when you're raised to life you're not gonna have them tattoos you know what I mean like I, I pray that I don't have any of this wicked stuff well I don't believe that God's gonna have us in a glorified body not a tattooed body you know what I mean so what would be what this is what I would say biblically speaking because God's gonna what's the intent you don't have to answer me I'm just you question yourself think about it what is your intention what's the motive behind it why are you doing it and the money you're spending on that maybe God wants you to do something else with that money you know so I'm not gonna be like you're definitely sinning if it's a, like a Bible verse I'm not gonna be like dude you're sinning but I'm gonna be like I'm gonna make arguments of dude why though like why do it like even if like say so I got a tattoo right here and my reason was like I want people to see like, like if they see it to know that to know my values to know that yeah. Like, yeah, and I, I feel like do you think that's just like I'm not I'm not gonna like I said if it's something like you know whatever biblical thing or whatever I'm not gonna be like dude you're definitely sinning 
Now, like I said, God in the Old Testament, he didn't want them doing it. So I would kind of appeal to that, like, maybe we really shouldn't do that because he didn't want the Israelites to do that. Not that we're under the Old Testament law. We're in the law of Christ, the New Testament. But that does give us an idea that God didn't like it. You know what I mean? So I would really, I would really put some weight on that of rather be safe than sorry and don't do it. But I, I'm just saying I'm not going to be like you're definitely sinning it like if you put John 3.16 on you or something, you know, but it's like the other thing too is 2 Corinthians 6 says to come out from among the world and be separate. Don't touch what is unclean and I will receive you. God, I will receive you. Right, and I'll give you some another Bible verses God's bringing to me right now. James 4.4 4 says this, adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? God. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So we're not to be like the world. 1 John 2, 15 through 17 says, Love not the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So you don't even have God in you if you love anything of the world. And he says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he that does the will of God remains forever. So I would hit you with those verses, you know, that we're not to be like the world. You know what I mean? Do you have any questions? Or? Oh, okay. I just want to shake your hand. Oh, okay. Hey, like God bless. It's got my information on it, man. If you ever want to reach out or anything. All right, man. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. I, I saw you kind of listening for a while. I didn't, I didn't want to like ignore you, dude. So. I, I grew up you know, in church. Grandma's okay. a pastor. So I learned a lot of this stuff. And I know like, I was like spreading the gospel. People going to right. judge. Right. And be across the world. It's like when they argue, it's like, you know, they say, you know, you know, you know, you know, you can't judge what you say because God is right. He's the one making the judgment, right. All I can do, like, all I can do, man, if I I love you. I'm gonna give you the truth. You believe what you want. It's all I can do, right? So yeah, man. I, I appreciate it, man. I've, I've actually ran into some people that were very supportive today, man. So, and the good thing is, like, when we leave, y'all get to talk to them. It opens up the door for more one-on-ones. And maybe you might be like, well, I personally wouldn't like you. I wouldn't personally do it like them. But I mean, what they're saying is right. I talked to this dude with the bald head, with the beard, short dude, you know, and. Uh, I mean, he gave me a lot of Bible, and look, man, he gave me a track. This is his stuff. You can check out what he says, man. Because the goal is we want everyone to go to heaven. We don't want nobody to go to hell. Right. Because that's eternal. Right. Like, dude, that's like the, like, I don't want nobody to go to hell, man. Ain't no going out. Nah. Nah, man. I mean, it's it's really, it's, it's so logical. It's like, dude, if, if this building had a bunch of bombs in it, and I know it, and you're going in, like, dude, I'm not going to stand here and be like, ah, don't worry about it. I don't want to hurt their feelings. I'll sound like a mean guy. No, I'm going to be screaming like, dude, don't go in there. There's a bunch of bombs in there. You're about to die. You know, we're talking about an everlasting torment. And we all deserve it. Not that I'm still sinning, but we all deserve it because we've all sinned against God. God has every right. He could have struck me dead in my sin, man. And he had mercy on us. All these people have a chance to repent, but they've got to respond to it, you know? Right. Right, man. Right. Absolutely, man. But something I learned is like, you just can't force it. We just got to let them nah, come first. Right, so, right. And that, that's like what we did today. Like when we started off, uh, this brother here, he, uh, the one with the red hair, he started preaching first, started drawing a little bit of a crowd. Then he wanted me to take over. I started preaching. My voice is a lot louder when I preach. It sounds like more militant. <laughs> just the way it is. And that really started drawing a bigger crowd. And like hours later, they're still here. I'm not saying literally the same people, but they just keep coming. And I mean, I mean, it's 348 now. I think we, I don't remember when we got here, man. We may, we may have started around 11, I think. Okay, yeah. I remember walking around, I was scoping out this place that I've never been here before. And I saw this, and I'm like, well, this looks like a good place. Yeah, so. 
And I, I mean, this was so good here that I plan on being back. I just don't know when because I work a full-time job. So when I take off work, dude, I lose a lot of money, man. And I got bills to pay, you know what I mean? So it's like, it's like I, I would love to do this every week because of all the conversations we have. But it's like I just I got to work, man. You know? So. So you're borrowing from the Bible. Hey, get, hey, if he's Muslim, give him the Muslim tracks, man. I'm about to go get it. Well, okay. Got some in your pockets? Uh, no, they're in my bag, there, man. I, mean, I, I respect you guys. You know, I yeah, respect yeah. you guys. Yeah, yeah. No hate. Yeah, we got we got some Muslim tracks, man. Uh, you got? You, did you bring some? Okay. He's got some Muslim tracks, man. Yeah. It's really good stuff, man. I was born in Palestine. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jerusalem. Right. Right. So. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Therefore, A equal B, B equal A. That is why. Dude, that's like 10 minutes from my house. Okay, so going back to the tattoo. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, say like in, I'm in not going to say you're in yeah. sin. However, I'd really like, I would encourage you not to. I just like, I'm going to give an account to God. So I don't want to be like, you're definitely in sin if you do that. I know in my conscience, I would never do that. Uh, I can appeal to the Old Testament and God did not want the Israelites to mark up their body. So would and you, that ought to give you an idea that if God didn't want them to do it, why would he want us to do it? So would you advise using that money to, instead of buying like a cross or something? Uh, I mean, whatever God wants you to do, you know, whether it's taking care of somebody or representing I'm, faith in a different way. Right. I mean, like these dudes, I mean, you can literally proclaim the gospel. Just these shirts are from, um, I think it's called preachinggear.com on the internet. And you can, you can pick your own signs and stuff. If you want to like evangelize without saying a word, get a t-shirt. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of like, like, shirts and stuff that are very fashionable. I took a week off. To do this? Yeah, so I love you guys. <laughs> I, I see a lot of merch on that night. It's like very fashionable for right. like people of our generation, but it still has like good right, meaning. Right, right, right. And stuff on right. It. Which is cool. Yeah, knowing that there's still a lot of Christians and mm -hmm. stuff out there, there's still like, like generations and yeah. people changing. Yeah, man. I, yeah, I mean, I, I used to wear those shirts, but like I said, with all my tattoos, I just felt convicted by God, like, just cover them things up, man. That's why I wear long sleeves. Yeah, you, uh, you can find, like, long sleeve shirts if you look online with, like, verses on them or right. whatever. You but, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I mean, obviously, it's perfectly fine to wear shorts, as long as they're long enough. You know, I, I would advise down to the knee, be right. modest, you know, love your neighbors yourself. And, and t-shirt, perfect, like, you got perfectly fine. You know, it's not clinging to you. You don't look like you're walking around naked. You know what I mean? Um, you know, I used to wear the t-shirts with the stuff on it. Because, dude, it gets a lot of attention when you're walking through, like, Walmart. Grocery stores are like, I really like your shirt. Or it sparks up a conversation. I ain't even have to say anything. Right. I'm like a billboard. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Like, and that's, that's like, a great way. Like, especially if you're kind of new to it, you can get some t-shirts proclaim something like there's no sinners like i got i i had some shirts i think i gave to them on the back it's i think it was on the back it said um god will forgive if you stop your sin dude most people are like what how'd you how'd you stop your sinning you know what i mean is there a verse that says god opposes the proud but yes. the meek he gives grace to the humble right yeah, Peter quotes that's out of the Old Testament, and uh, James quotes it, that God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I mean, look, it takes humility to admit you're wrong. You know what I mean? It took humility for me. I didn't believe in Jesus like 18 years ago. I was agnostic. And Jesus spoke to me out of the blue. I don't, you may have heard my testimony earlier. Yeah. He just spoke to me out of the blue and said, pick up the Bible and come follow me. I didn't even believe in that stuff. You know, I was like agnostic, you know, and that's, that's how I convert. <laughs> and I just started reading the New Testament and I gave my life to him. I forsook it all, man. And he changed me. Of course, I got baptized immediately. Like the first thing I wanted to do is I got to get baptized. And what does the church want to do? 
I don't know how long it was, but basically like wait until we, you know, get around to it. And it's like, no, nah, that's garbage, man. It's, it's baptized now. I want to get baptized, man, you know? And, uh, but they, you know, unfortunately, many churches are not obeying what the Lord says, you know? But it, it doesn't have to be a church to baptize you. Any Christian guy can baptize, you know? So it doesn't have to be like a pastor. But, you know, at the time, I I didn't really know that kind of stuff. I was so ignorant. You know? So. You know what's going to happen to your tattoos if you die in your city? It's going to melt. It's going to melt. I'm going to have a new body. I mean, you can just see, like, yeah, I mean, there's there's mockers and stuff, but they do, they just keep coming up, man. I mean, it's just, and, like, I, like, I don't even have to even say much. They see the bad news, they see the good news, they see the signs, and it's like, so. All we can really do is really just pray for them. Yeah, like, when we leave, in fact, I would encourage y'all to do that. Like, when we leave, we pray. You got to pray for God to give the increase. And we know... You know, we know that most people, they're going to reject. You know, they love their sin. I used to love my sin too, man. But there will be some, even if there's only one, that will come around. I just spoke to a dude yesterday at Kent State. And I believe he said it was just a year ago. He forsook his sin and turned to Jesus. I'm like, that's awesome, dude. You know what I mean? Like, that that's what it's about, man. But even if nobody was converted, God still gets the glory to them because we proclaimed his word, you know? And the thing is, when we go out and preach, like all we're doing is scattering the seed. We, it may take years before they convert. You know, Paul talks about that one, one uh, waters, you know, the other reaps the increase, right? One lays the foundation, another comes, waters upon the foundation. But it's God that gives the increase. God is the one that does this. He just uses us to proclaim his word, you know? That's our basic message right there. But yeah, the basic message in a nutshell is your sin separates you from God. If you're still if you're still in your sin, I don't know you. If you're still in your sin, you're a sinner. The wages of sin is death, which is the lake of fire. Okay. God the Father provided a way out through his son Jesus Christ. He kept the law of God perfectly. You didn't, neither did I. And because of that, his blood that he shed at Calvary is able to abundantly and perfectly cleanse you. Because Leviticus 17, 11 says the life of the flesh is in its blood. And it gives atonement for the soul. And th that was animals. But that was a shadow to point to Jesus. His blood cleanses us from all sin. So the commandment now is you recognize that you're if you're a sinner, the first step is you need to count the cost if you're going to follow Jesus or not. Jesus said in Luke 14, 26, whoever comes to me and hates not his father, mother, wife, children, brother, sister, yes, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. So you got to count the cost. Now, he's not literally telling you hate those people. It's a hyperbole. It's very serious. If you come to him, you need to count the cost because you're probably going to lose all kinds of people. You're going to look like a fool, and you need to count the cost. If you're willing to forsake it all, and then you do what Peter said in Acts 2.38. The same people that had Jesus put to death on the cross, when he preached the gospel to them, after Jesus rose from the dead, he, they were like, what do we do? What do we do? We put this man to death. What do we do? And he said, repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sin. You'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's what it means to be born again, John 3, verse 3 and verse 5. Because Jesus said, unless you're born again, you're not going to heaven. You have to repent, forsake all your sin that you're aware of, turn in a childlike faith to Jesus Christ, a complete surrender, get baptized, water baptized. After you do that, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, making you born again. Now, I'm certainly not saying God cannot give the Spirit before water baptism. He did with me and many people, probably because today most people, most churches are like, well, we'll baptize you in like three months. You know what I mean? So... God is willing and able to That's abundantly right. Jesus, pardon, Jesus said the same but you've got to give up your law breaking. It's conditioned. Yeah. How you know what I mean? And then God, he gives you the spirit 
his spirit to live in you to, to give you the power to walk like Jesus from here on out. And if you do sin as a Christian, not when, I taught the many, we, we taught the many professing Christians are like, yeah, but, but I'm going to sin. No, show me a Bible verse that says you're going to sin. It says, if we sin. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. That's 1 John 2.1. No like it's if, it's never when. No if you're in Christ, you will not sin, 1 John that, 3. That like you will not sin. Jesus. But if you're tempted, James chapter 1, 14 through 15, <clears throat> says you're being drawn away by your own desires. You're being enticed. You're not sinning. You're just being enticed to sin. But when that desire, if you capture it, you conceive it, you capture that thought that popped into your head, you, you give birth to sin. What's the wages of sin? In my You're opinion, saying, Zeus, if not when, you call him Zeus or you know, it's just or if, not Zeus when. Zeus or right. Or now, what I'm getting at, real, just real quick. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. Greeks when Greeks means I'm Greeks definitely going to sin, but it's if. I don't. I know for a fact, as long as I trust in Jesus and I follow Him. If I'm following you right now, let's pretend you're Jesus. Would you lead me into sin? Like the Egyptians no. Their gods, the so if I'm gods, not probably, absolutely not. Absolutely, absolutely not. That would be heretical. Jesus wouldn't lead me into sin. If I'm following Jesus, I don't go into sin. But it, no, I don't sin. I could sin. Yes, I had. Let, let, let me establish my terms. I have sinned in the past, probably more than you ever have. Okay, I'm a former gangbanger. He's been on all kinds of drugs. I was on dope, weed, all kinds of stuff, man. All right, I was very wicked. All of my sin has been atoned for. I have repented of my sin. I forsook everything I knew to forsook, so forsake. What, what did you do? What did you do with sin? Just turn away from it and turn a faith to Jesus. Yeah. So, so you, and I call, obviously you call out to the Lord. Okay, first of all, before you keep going, hold on. Hold on. Just, just so I can clarify here. Are you, you assuming that I'm one day that, that right? yes. You know, this, is, this is the life that I want to lead anymore. No, right. you didn't read the Bible, though. You read the subheading. You read the subheading. So, like, you're, like, kind of stuck on repentance. What is repentance? Okay. Do you want to know what, or is that what your question is? Like, is repentance, repent of sin, is that what you're wondering? Because many people think, well, repentance don't mean repent of sin. Well, I'm, I'm just asking. I'm trying to... Okay, so the NIV was, was translated in the beginning by West Court and Horton. I guess what I'm trying to use the critical text like, like the Sinaiticus, which has thousands of verses, right. and they omit scriptures. You know, yeah, that's the bad news, and then that's the good news. I'm just trying to help you. Know, the, the bad news of all these, you know, these so, so things you have that and one humans do that are sin. Right. So I'm trying to discern where you're coming from. That's why I'm subscribe to any one of these If you commit them, right. You know, you are a sinner. Right. You know. But you don't have to stay that way. But you don't have to stay that way. Right. Okay, so... Now, come on. There we go. Okay, I guess you know, let's okay. say a random person out here in the crowd, right? First what? You know, they they, they follow Jesus, right? Right? You know, or, you know, maybe in your guys, they they think they follow Jesus, but yeah. they're. Their friend, I'm gonna correct it. You know, they're what? Their, their friend or their, okay. you know, some, you know, someone in their life is maybe you know, a homosexual, yeah. or you know, they they subscribe to sinful ways. Right. You know, by supporting, you know, that person as your friend, are you a sinner too? Absolutely. If you, yeah, Absolutely. if you're, yeah, yeah, if let's establish our terms. Okay. If you're supporting their lifestyle, you hate them. Because Romans chapter 1, verses 28 through 32, it says, even if you're a prover, a prover of those that commit sin, you're worthy of death also. Now, this does not mean that I don't love the homosexual. It doesn't mean that if, let's say, I'm not going to college. I mean, I'm going on 46 years old. But let's say I was in college and I know somebody personally is a homosexual. I'm, I could be cordial with them. But if I love them, I'm going to tell them the truth. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, what fellowship hath the believer with the unbeliever? What communion has light with darkness? Now, this doesn't mean like I can't talk to sinners. That's what we're out here doing. That doesn't mean that I wouldn't even take them out to eat with me. But it just means I won't have that fellowship like, like me and him would. We don't have anything in common. You're not going to like what I got to say because I preach Jesus. Does that make sense?
So, oh, real quick, I was going to say, are you, there's actually, are you saying what the I'm doing is why wrong? That is, you know that God, am I doing what wrong? Is that if, if excuse me, excuse me, and a saint is what I'm doing wrong? It's not you just pass judgment. So basically, oh, either so the you're sinner a will cause the saint to fall you back into sin, the like saint the will, said, will cause the sinner to repent of their sins and become to Christ, or they'll both separate. You just said that's really the only three options when that situation is in the midst. You have somebody that you're associating with who is a sinner and you're a saint yourself. Those are the only three options. And so you have to be cautious when you're around because that sinner can lead you into sin again. You know? Yeah. I mean, the world is disgusting. So. Now, now I guess, you know, on your guys' side, you guys, I deal with this problem all the time. You know, yeah, that, that is, you know. Meaning, we don't, we have no present sin that we're aware of. Exactly. We are walking holy and obedient by the power of God living in us. But that doesn't mean I couldn't possibly commit a sin in the future, but I do believe so here, here, that I'll never sin again as long as I follow Jesus. His opinion. He thinks that we're Pharisees. No, that we're condemning everybody out here. You know, here. you guys are out here. You, you got your, you know, your GoPro camera. Right. You know, who okay. goes cost a couple hundred you, dollars? You know, you you're see, you've been with me all giving day. money to that, that company. Right. GoPro heavily supports the homosexual community. For years, they go out, right. you know, they support that community. They donate thousands people. and thousands of dollars, part of which was to people. Right. You know, okay. we spend money with okay. them. They donated some of that money. Well, let me let me answer your. So, so let me answer that. That's a good one. So I'll give you an example. That's good that you kind of brought that up. So my brother Nate behind me, he won't drink something from Starbucks. He feels convicted about that because apparently they support abortion. I don't know. Like that's what he said. And I said, okay, I'm definitely not faulting him for that because you need to obey your conscience. Exactly. You're not a follower. Now me personally, I don't really do Starbucks very often. Show me that. Hold on. I think it's ridiculous. But I like today. I have. I had a chai. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that Christians. And my conscience, I'm clear. Now because if I'm gonna apply my, my conscience and what I know with God, if I apply that standard, then I could literally basically have almost nothing on planet Earth because almost everything was made by wicked sin. Exactly. So if I'm going to, now that doesn't mean that, hey, I should like, you know, go, go to the strip club and watch naked women. I mean, there, obviously there's a line, you know what I mean? But like, and just like He's Jesus said, hey, you have to pay your taxes. And I'm exposing so if I have to render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's, well, the U.S. government endorses warfare. That's against Christian doctrine. We don't fight no matter what. But I'm, I'm commanded by Jesus to pay my taxes. Um, I'm commanded, you know, and they, they, I think they even help fund federally abortion to a degree. Oh, probably. So that's what I'm saying. Like they're doing that stuff, but Jesus says, pay your taxes. I'm not at fault for what they're doing. Now, if, if I, if God speaks to me, he's like, Hey man, I don't want you doing Starbucks anymore. You better believe I'm going to stop. It. Oh yeah. yeah. So, so, so it kind of comes down to, you know, I mean, and yes, it, it would be, you know, quite ridiculous to say, all right, I can't, you know, eat at McDonald's, you know, drink things from Starbucks, you know, I can't buy action cameras from GoPro. Or, well, here's the thing you know. that he said though, and the key, the key factor is that if your conscience as a saint convicts you of it, you still have to obey. Because that God, God, right. So, so what I guess my my conscience says. That yes, I, you know, you're wrong, and I'll show you how. I can subscribe to. Well, well wait a minute. Are you born again, though? Remember, we're coming from a born again state. Yeah. So you're coming from a. If you yeah, subscribe yeah, that, well, not born so again. let's let's draw the line here. We're, we're talking about some things that could be doubtful. Okay. The Bible talks about doubtful things. All right. This stuff is guaranteed concrete in the Word of God. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. Yeah. All right. So, you cannot be a drunkard. First Corinthians six nine says drunkards will not inherit the kingdom of God. So we always base our truth on what God says. Same with homosexuals. That's in there. Fornicators is in there. Jesus had a hatred for hypocrites. Matthew chapter uh, twenty three. Muslims don't believe Jesus is the Son of God, and Jesus said, unless you believe that I am He, you'll die in your sins. That's John eight twenty four. Sin approvers. Romans chapter one twenty eight through thirty two. If you approve of sin, you're deserving of death. Racists. We know. No, that's hatred. Thieves, same. That's First Corinthians six nine. Liars is Revelation twenty one eight. 
which says the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, idolaters, sorcerers, and all liars will have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. All liars. It doesn't say all liars except if you say that you're a Christian. It says all liars. Uh, atheist, you're saying there's no God. That's foolishness. Uh, drug user, that's sorcery. In the Greek, when you see the English word sorcerer, that's from the Greek root word pharmakia, which literally means a drugger. You're partaking in drugs. That's where we get our English word pharmacy. Okay? Idolaters, that's 1 Corinthians 6, 9. And transgenders is also in 1 Corinthians 6, 9. The King James translates the Greek word malakoi, which is from the Greek root word malakos, which means soft, effeminate. It can encompass a catamite. You know, somebody likes little boys. Um, yeah, the next Greek word after that is arsenokoitai, which is from the root word arsenokoites, which literally means a man with another man in bed doing, obviously, what is shameful. Yeah. It's sodomy. So, same. Romans chapter 1 talks about the woman. Um, it says when the woman leaves the natural use of the man, they burn in their lust one for the other. And it's talking about, like, sexual stuff. And then it goes on and says the same thing about the guy. So. I mean, I guess, I guess the part that I, I, I feel like there's kind of a hole here is, you know, outside of these things, you know, it comes down to, you know, what is your conscience, you know? Right. You know. Yes. God says that homosexuals are not... Uh, if they stay that way. You know, they stay There's that hope way. for them to repent. There's like, I, for them to like repent. I know real quick, I know a former homosexual, he just got married to a woman. Okay. And he, I didn't even know he was a homosexual. I know a former transgender dressed straight like a woman. I don't know him that well, but I've met him. Dressed like a straight woman, man. And now he dresses like a man. Now he's preaching the gospel. So that's what God does with people. He changes them. But I, I guess it, it comes down to... That's the premise. It, it, He's talking to from my perspective here, it mm -hmm. seems like you're like, okay, yeah, you know, the Lord says that we can, that we should not subscribe to these, you know, things. They are not, they, they are sinful. We shall not partake in them. Period. But you know, but we can we can fudge the lines a little if my conscience is okay with it. Well, no, that's kind of what I. That's kind of yeah. That's that's not that's not what I'm saying. So your conscience can become seared. Okay. Okay. So basically, like, if you are truly born again, the Spirit of God is living in you, and He speaks to you. God speaks to me and shows me stuff quite often. And if I don't like, even if it's the smallest thing, like you know, Keith, I want you to let go of that. I'll give you a little. I'll give you an idea. I'm not saying this is definitely sin, but to me, it was something God spoke to me. And this is a doubtful thing. So when I first came into the faith, I was listening to Christian rap. Okay. I don't do that now. God was really speaking to me like, look, let go of this. Because I used to listen to gangster rap and it kind of, that beat is kind of putting you in that kind of, yeah, man, like that mentality. I'm not even saying it necessarily did that to me, but it's the beat, man. So... I know God was showing me that if I it's not a big deal and I brush it off I start searing my conscience the Bible talks about that and when you do that you're in sin because you're not obeying God it's willful sin and then you start deceiving yourself because you're not walking in truth Saul is a perfect example of this in the Old Testament first Samuel um, 15 God literally told him destroy the Amalekites destroy these people and then he spared he says destroy everything Everything, their stuff but then he saves like some of the best of the flock and he used Samuel to rebuke him and said basically I'm paraphrasing all this you can read about it later and, he's, and he rebukes him and he's like what are you doing you disobeyed God and Sam, uh, Saul tries to justify like but but I was I was keeping this for God I mean I was going to sacrifice to God and Samuel's like that's not what God said and because of that, the kingdom is going to be torn from you and given to a man after his own heart, which was King David. 
But so so you say one can sear their conscience. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I've done it in the past. And you've done it in the past. So Paul would have never had to go back to our, our example of you know, Starbucks. Mm -hmm. You know, now you're like, I, man, I really love a chai tea latte. You don't think that like, you know? No, I don't. I I would not say that's a sin. It could be. But, but, Depends. You, but you're supporting those who support sinful acts. Yeah. And but because you but I'm not support but I'm not supporting that but you're not supporting the sinful acts but you're supporting well, I'll get, those who do I'll give you a perfect example if you look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8 okay. and I believe Romans chapter 14 back in this time you had this issue of the Gentiles were going out into the meat market to buy meat typically during the Roman Empire I don't, I don't know how well you guys know history but meats were sacrificed to idols Christians cannot eat meat sacrificed to idols okay but in first Corinthians chapter 8 I believe it is Paul talks about the fact that look an idol is nothing and we know that there's only one God and if a brother's weak in the conscience you know we have to consider that my conscience is like I, I what he's basically addressing is don't ask questions you know we're in the world they're endorsing sin you know do what God's telling you to do if, if so like with the example of paying taxes like I know they're using my money to do wicked things but I have to pay my taxes you know just like if I'm in the world I have to like pay my bills like literally if you wanted to apply that standard I couldn't have a MacBook I've got a MacBook I couldn't have an iPhone I've got an iPhone I couldn't drive I probably couldn't drive Chevy I got a Chevy car I don't maybe I couldn't drive a Ford like what am I gonna drive more and more con more and more companies are becoming LGBT pride supportive in the fact that they're supporting it uh, maybe some of them are paying for abortions but it's like well then you literally basically couldn't buy nothing and Paul kind of addresses that in like Romans 14 and first Corinthians 8 there's probably other Bible verses I'm not really thinking about the moment we're to be in the world but not of the world so these doubtful things is between you and God you know if you get a Starbucks coffee I'm not gonna be like oh you're, you're, bro you're in sin I'm not gonna say that however if you tell me like if you were part of my fellowship and you tell me God says I have to cut off Starbucks I'm gonna hold you to that. you know because that's your that's what God has spoken to you yeah you know if God spoke to me and said like I live in Ohio if he's like I want you to move and go to Texas I have to do that now is it a sin for you if you stay in Ohio absolutely not God didn't tell you to go to Texas but he told me to go told you to go to Texas. Right. so so it would be a sin to stay in Ohio yeah if God told me to go to Texas and I don't obey him it's a sin it's willful sin and now now, wouldn't you say it's a little? I mean, a little unreasonable. You know, if I, if I, you know, if I follow God, mm -hmm. you know, and I, you know, am born again, and I want to follow. I want to follow him. But, you know, he, he tells me that living where I do, you know, living in California, living in Ohio, living, you know, there is not, you know, not what he wants for me. Like, right. obviously, some, some people, it's. What do I do? Look at this it, it, it seems oh, a little crazy to think, yeah, All these people can uproot their life and, you know, yeah. some, yeah. It, does God, you know, himself. understand that that? Says, right, you know, so, yeah, right. It's not financially feasible for some people. Well, you, I mean, you like, have to pay your taxes. You have to, you know, do, the, you know, do these other things mm -hmm. and not everybody, you know, can maybe afford the same way of life. The, you know, the, the but, interesting thing with God so is that if he wants you to leave, he wants you to do it in faith and obey him. But also God, in my experience, and there's other brothers that can testify, this brother right here, God provides a way. Hey, bro. Paul. Paul. Are you talking to them? Huh? Are you talking to them? I'm not talking to anyone. So don't talk about it on camera because I don't want to. You know what I'm getting at. So don't talk about it. It's between us and God. Okay. But how many times has God provided for you? God want like he got stuck with crazy bills and God paid. Dude, I'm talking bills. thousands of dollars. God paid for it. I had my car break down one time and I had to get fixed. And I didn't know how I was going to do it. 
and the world right. just paid for so it. You're, it's like that. A, a check came in the mail. It's just money. They don't care about that. God uses his saints. He'll speak to, like, for example, let's, I'm going to use a hypothetical. Let's say you're a Christian, and God's like, hey, let's say your name's Paul, and he's like, hey, Keith, I want you to give Paul $4,000. I'm going to give you $4,000. Going to go obey God. And I'm telling you, this brother's a living example that God has provided a lot of times. This dude don't make that much money. I make a lot more money than he does, and God's provided. Now, look, I'm not saying, look, God is not a genie in a bottle. I'm not saying, like, there ain't times you suffer. You know, there's times I'm like, I could get tempted with worry. Like, for example, I got a water leak in my house right now. I thought it was, like, minor. I didn't even realize the water lines were leaking. I just realized there was some mold, and I'm like, oh, this is wonderful. Um, and I started ripping stuff apart. My water line's leaking, dude. It's been leaking in my wall. I'm like, what on earth am I going to do? You can trust the Lord, bro. I, I just, I didn't even worry about it. I'm like, whatever, man. And I didn't even realize it. It just came to me. I know this sounds silly to you, but to me, like, I didn't even think about it. It was like, check with homeowners. You're sinning. So I check, we check with homeowners. My deductible is $1,000. They're literally basically going to remodel all kinds of, like, that doesn't even have to do with the mold, just to make the room match. I'm like, what? I'm going to get brand new cabinets when only my sink cabinet is ruined. My whole bathrooms are going to get remodeled. Now, I, I will have to pay for the water line because that's not part of the homeowners, but it's like, I mean, when the inspector came out, she was like, so cool, and she's like, yeah, well, I mean, you'll even get the walls painted, and I'm like, what? So I know that sounds crazy, but it's like, you know, and there's times that I could get tempted with, oh, what, man, I'm like, what am I going to do with this? But I don't, I don't worry about it, man. And, and I'm not, look, I'm not saying God every time is like, here, man, here's some money, here's some money, here's some money. That's not always like that, man. Sometimes you got to suffer. But it's like, it's amazing. He's had times, I'm sure, where it's been like that, but the Lord... He always takes care of you somehow. Now, like I said, Christians are going to suffer, man. especially when the Antichrist comes in the future. In Revelation, the Lord allows the Antichrist to destroy the saints. You know, because look, the Father God gave up his son. So if he gave up his son, like, I'll lay down my life for him if I have to. You know? Um, and that time is coming. You know, I've heard, I'm sure you may have heard of Mark of the Beast to come in the future and all this stuff. I don't know if you have, but there's movies about it. A lot of it's nonsense. It's not biblical. But uh, it is coming in the future. And you can see that there's some little things that are pointless to that. Now, obviously, the vaccine and the mass are not the mark of the beast. That's stupid. Bro, it's but it, it's, it's, worship, it's, yeah, it's conditioning you to be like, you can't go in that building unless you wear your mask. You can't go into this concert unless you prove that you've been vaccinated. It's getting you used to this idea. It's like the, it's like the frog in a pot. It, this is real. If you put a frog in a pot and you turn up the heat, he ain't going to do nothing. He'll just chill. If it's a big pot, I mean, obviously he might you know, jump a little bit. You slowly turn up the heat, man. He won't even realize it. He adjusts. Eventually, he dies. Right. And it's, and it's yeah. And it's like now, you know, we're, you're just being conditioned. I don't know if you, how much you follow the news. I'm not into politics, but I do check on the news. It's like the digital dollar that's getting ready to come out. That comes out. That's bad news, man. And they're, they're, they're all, they have already released it, testing it. This isn't a conspiracy theory. You can Google this. They've already released it for certain people to test out. They released that thing. That's bad news, man. Because it's the, it's the federal, um, not the federal government, but they are the ones control. Federal Reserve. Thank you. 1013? What? Yeah, first Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. The Federal Reserve is the one that's going to control this. It's not going to come from your employee. It's literally banked with them. Yeah. yeah, that's kind of scary because if you know anything about China right now, they have what's called a social credit score. Oh, yeah. If you get out of line, I don't know what the star system is, but we'll, we'll use a hypothetical. You get out of line, you say something I don't like, you donate your money to people I don't like, I take a star from you. You get too low, you can't leave, you can't leave the province that you are in China. That's terrifying. <laughs> you know what I mean? 
and they're getting ready to release that. Now, I'm not saying America is immediately going to start a social credit score, but it's coming. It's possible it's coming to control the masses. You know what I mean? You're already seeing that a little bit. Like if you if you say things people don't like, typically homosexuality, transgenderism, you say stuff people don't like, and it's like, no, you can't say that. It's like, dude, it's America. It's First Amendment. They can say what they want. I can say what I want. Yeah. But yet you see that being stifled. The only reason why right now you see this going on on college campuses is because years ago street preachers actually had lawsuits against these colleges. Not, I'm not saying this one. Against colleges because they were saying you can't offend people. And now you see they, they, they back off. Because this is a public university. You know what I mean? Freedom of speech. It's paid for by taxpayer dollars. I know I kind of went on a tangent, but um, yeah, you can just kind of see the sign of the times. I don't know how old you are, but I'm I'm going on 46, dude. And dude, the wickedness in this country is unbelievable, man. I mean, most women walk around. They might. Why are they even wearing clothes? I mean, they're totally nude. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, man? I know what you're saying. And like, I, I I go to the I I went to the Columbus Pride event. I preached there. Yeah. There, dude, there are women walking around, nothing on. They had like something little here, but nothing here. Yeah. But like a little paint dot. Yeah, man, all that you want. Um, and I'm just, and there's children all around. Dude, if I drop my pants right now, I guarantee you he'd come up here and arrest me. But during a pride event, it's okay. I mean, no, I mean, I 100% get, you know, there are, you know, we don't come out here and double standards in, so in our society, and you know, we there there is hate that goes on. Right. You know, I guess. People may not look at it like that, but that's what it is. I know what it is. I don't want to interrupt you, bro. But you did express it in like. I guess I guess my thoughts, you know, kind of stem from. No, of course. I'm, I'm, You're trying, really right I'm trying to I, I don't, you know, subscribe to any, you know, religion. I'm not a Catholic. I'm not. I used to be the same any, way. You know, any denomination. Right. Um, I, mean, I, I don't know if you associate with any... No know, denomination. No denomination, you know. So... Yeah, for me, yeah. You know, for me, what? Not because I, I think that there's, you know, foul things that go on in, in you know, nope. some of these churches. Yep. I'm sure no doubt. Probably, you know, I agree. The same thing. But, you know, I've also run in to, you know, to people that are, you know, street preachers. Right. And, you know, the God that I was taught about throughout my life, I, I wouldn't think that he would support them acting in the way that they do. Yeah, I... I There's people that... And I think part of the reason that you guys might get some backlash here is... I think sometimes people of the Christian faith attack people and their humanity you know right. and you know they're just they're just living their life right. and people come out here and they attack them for who they are right. right well I so what I would say is I can't speak for uh, every street preacher I can only speak for myself um, you know we didn't tie anybody down obviously you know that they, they so when we started off uh, this brother I believe preached first started drawing a little bit of a crowd then I started preaching. Now, when I preach, it sounds like a military drill sergeant. Like, it's very loud. It's just my voice when I preach. That really drew a bigger crowd. And we were just holding signs, and that draws them in. And most of the day has been spent with this, just conversations. Now, look, we got to give them the truth. I mean, if it's true, I'm just using your worldview. If it is true what Jesus said, that sinners will end up in hellfire for all of eternity. And I don't warn people, you're on your way to hell, but you don't have to go there. Here's the remedy. I would hate you. There's no greater form of hate. And yeah, it doesn't make people feel good. You know, it, but Jesus didn't make people feel good all the time either. If you read, I would, I don't know if you ever have, you don't need to even answer me, but I would just encourage you to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament, read about Jesus' life and everything he said. If you've never really looked at it or maybe just kind of glossed over it, you'd be floored at some of the things Jesus said. I mean, Matthew chapter 13, verse 41, Jesus would preach in open squares like this 
And he sat there and said, the Son of Man will gather out of his kingdom. He's talking about himself. I will gather out of my kingdom all those that offend and those that work iniquity, meaning you're still sinning, and cast them into a furnace of fire. Dude, that does not sound good. And it didn't make people feel good. But it's the truth. If Jesus doesn't tell him, he hates him. He was here to tell him the truth, that you're, you're currently condemned. But I, if you follow me, I'm going to bring you salvation. I'm going to save you. And the Bible teaches you're saved by grace through faith. You can't earn it. Can't do enough good stuff to earn it, right? Like, if I break the law in Ohio and I can just keep doing it, doing it, doing it, like, I'm going to get arrested. I'm going to stand before the judge. And if the judge is right, if he's just, I'm going to get punishment for that. I could go to jail for that, right? The same's with God. He's a just judge. He's not going to let you off the hook because, well, I'm a pretty good person. What have I done? Well, have you lied? Have you committed? I'm not telling you to answer me, but have you lied? Have you committed adultery? No, I've never been married. Well, Jesus said lusting is adultery. That's Matthew 5, 28. Are you a murderer? No, I've never committed murder. Have you ever hated somebody? Most people have. I have too. First John 3, 15 says, if you hate your brother, you're a murderer. And no murderer has eternal life abiding in So Jesus is looking at your heart. So it shows the state of, man, our sin cuts us off from God. We need salvation. And it's through Jesus. Whether or not you believe that, that's between you and God. But Jesus made it very clear in John 14, 6. He said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So that's it. So either three, either one of three things you can conclude. conclude. He's lying, he's psychotic, and needs to go to a mental institution. Or he really is the Son of God. Now we could look at history. Okay, so his apostles, one of them killed themselves, Judas Iscariot, because he betrayed Jesus. He could have repented, but he didn't. The apostle John did, wasn't martyred, but the other apostles were martyred. The apostle Peter was crucified upside down. I don't want to take chances. I don't want to test the grace of God. Bartholomew was skinned alive. The apostle James was thrown off a roof by the Jews. And he didn't even die. They came down and beat him to death. Other testimonies say he was stoned after that. But I. So what I'm getting at is all these men, they were Israelites. And they, they said, we saw, and they, they, everybody knew back then Jesus died on the cross. I even have Ro the Roman historian, Tashin. I have his writings, and he, even he talks about Jesus. Now, he didn't believe that he's the Son of God, but it's a fact he died on the cross. And these apostles are claiming, think about how crazy this is. They go around, they say, he rose from the dead. I touched him. I saw him. I ate with him. Over 500 people saw him, according to the book of Acts. And these people ruined their life. For what? A lie? The Apostle Paul, I don't know how well you know the New Testament, but the Apostle Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was like a quote-unquote great man in Israel. And he was killing Christians. He was persecuting the Christians. And Jesus converted him. Long story short, he converted him. And he used Paul to preach the gospel to non-Israelites, us, the Gentiles, if you're not a Jew. And uh, Paul had his life ruined. He had everything he wanted, man, in the world, you know what I'm saying? Like, he had it all. And his life was completely ruined, but it really wasn't. He lost everything now, but he gained eternal life. So what I'm getting at is why would these men die for a doubt or a lie? We're not talking about suicide bombers that plant, put bombs on themselves, walk in there and blow themselves up. I used to be suicidal. That's cowardice. We're talking about if you don't deny Jesus, I'm going to kill your wife and then I'm going to kill you. I'm not denying Jesus. The Apostle Peter's wife was literally drug away, and according to testimony, he screamed out, just don't forsake Jesus. So, I guess to, you know, lead a, a life in which I accept Jesus into my life. So, I understand no sin is acceptable no and I accept Jesus into my life and I well let, let me sorry willful sin like you might be in a sin of ignorance meaning 
you're doing something that God sees as sinful, but you literally have no idea it's wrong. In that case, you're not a sinner, okay? I'll give you a Bible verse if you want to remember it. It's John chapter 9, verses, uh, I think it's 38 through 40. Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and he said, if you were blind, the Pharisees weren't blind. You know, he's speaking about you're spiritually blind. You don't see what I'm saying. If you were blind, you would have no sin. But you say, we see, therefore your sin remains. So what he's saying is, if you were blind, if you really didn't know about me and all that, you don't have any sin. You wouldn't have sin if you were ignorant about me. But now you see me, therefore your sin remains. You're denying what I'm telling you. Yeah. So you could be doing something ignorantly and you like have no idea it's wrong. You're not going to hell over that. But if you know, and we know by God's word, right? That's objective truth that we go to. And we're in the New Testament. That's what Christians are in to make it easy for you. You're in the New Testament. So whatever the New Testament says, you obey. And you do it through the power of the spirit. God gives you his spirit to do that. And go ahead. So it's willful sin. You have knowledge, and you're like, you know what? I know I'm not supposed to lie, but I'm going to do it anyway. That's willful sin. You die in that without repenting, turn it, confessing it, and forsaking it, you'll go to hell. Go ahead, man. So some person in like an indigenous tribe. That's a good, good question, right? They believe in the sun god of Ra. Right. Whoever. A lot of a lot of Egyptians believe in that, right? Like. They've never heard of Jesus, mm -hmm. so they're going to heaven. This is what I would say. You're not going to hell because you never heard of Jesus. You're going to hell because of your sin. So let me explain this. First off, Jesus said that when I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. Now, I didn't convert because somebody preached the gospel to me. Jesus actually spoke to me. In the Middle East, there's lots of Muslims that, now they believe in a Jesus, it's not the Jesus of the Bible. While Jesus in the, in the Quran, I've got like three of them, he's called Isa. It's not the same Jesus of the Bible. Yeah, they say he's not the son of God, okay? That, that's one thing. So anyways, um, Muslims, there are lots of Muslims, there's testimonies of this where Jesus spoke to them in a dream and revealed to them that he is the son of God. So what I'm getting at is Jesus has his ways of converting people who have never heard of Jesus. For example, in Acts chapter 10, I don't know how well you know the Bible, Cornelius was a Gentile. He never heard of Jesus, but it says that he feared God and he prayed to God always. He was totally ignorant, right? And then Jesus spoke to Peter. God spoke to Peter and said, hey, I'm going to send men your way. You're going to follow them. Make a long story short, Peter followed the men to Cornelius and he gave Cornelius the gospel. And the reason why God did that for Cornelius is number one, he feared God. Number two, he was praying to God always and he was giving his alms. He was giving money away to the poor generously. So it's not that he was earning anything, but God saw his heart like this guy knows that I'm alive and he's loving his neighbor as himself. He's a sinner. He sinned in the past at some point, right? But he's walking in the knowledge of me that he has. So I'm going to give him the whole truth about my son, Jesus. And literally that's what God kind of done to me when he spoke to me 18 years ago. He literally spoke to me. So what I'm talking about is like the guy in Indonesia, never heard of Jesus. Let's do that hypothetical. They're not going to hell because they never heard of Jesus. They're going to hell because of their sin. See, God gave you, it says in Romans chapter two, that God gave you, he wrote the law of God on your heart. And he gives you the conscience that testifies to this. So what this is saying is that uh, it talks about the Gentiles, which are non-Israelites. The Gentiles who didn't have the law, meaning they were not Israelites, they never were given any of that stuff that, that Israel got. When the Gentiles who don't have the law, yet they do by nature the things that are contained in the law. These, although not having that law, are a law to themselves. They show the law of God written on their heart and their conscience proves that. So in layman's terms, what that's saying is, you know intrinsically, lying is wrong, stealing is wrong, being a thief is wrong, hurting somebody is wrong. So to wrap it up real quick, what I'm saying is they go to hell for that sin. And if they refuse to obey the knowledge that they have, it's their fault. Okay? So God 
if you're truly wanting to desire to know if Jesus is the Son of God or just God, period, maybe you never heard of Jesus, God will reveal Jesus to you. He literally did it for me. He does it to people all the time. I know that's kind of a long explanation, but I want to be kind of fair with it. What do you it, so. think about, like, before Christ was born? The Bible answers that, right? So, when what about all that? Or right. Muslims, well, bef before, yeah, before Jesus, there was no uh, Islam. That came in the 600s. Well, actually, a little before the 600s, but around that time. So, to answer your question, what about the people before Jesus died on the cross? That's a great question. Well, it says in Romans chapter 3 that God in his forbearance passed over the sins that were previously committed. So, I have to explain that to you. If they, if they, if the Israelites, they knew the Messiah was coming. If they were obeying God according to the knowledge they had, God was going to look upon the atonement of Jesus to come in the future. So they're not going to hell. Okay. Now the persons outside of Israel who never heard of Yahweh, God the Father, okay, those people, us Gentiles, it actually answers this in 1 Peter chapter 3 that Jesus went and preached to the spirits in prison that died in the days of Noah. This is kind of a long doctrinal thing, but Jesus went and preached to them in, in prison, basically in Hades. There is an in-between, not purgatory, that's a corruption. That's another doctrine. I'll give you it in a nutshell. If you read Luke 16, if you was to die right now, do this hypothetical. Let's pretend you're a Christian. I don't know if you are. Let's say you're a Christian and you do die in the faith. You're not in sin. You, there's two parts to Hades. There's Abraham's bosom, the upper parts, paradise. Wonderful. The lower part is a part of torment. It's not the lake of fire yet, but there's some kind of a torment. Jesus talks about this in Luke 16. You await there, kind of like a holding place, until the resurrection, when Jesus comes back. All right? You will return to your body and receive a glorified body. A body that's not corrupted like this, that ages and wrinkles and sags and gets old and gains body fat and all that stuff. Also, the unrighteous that are going to end up in a lake of fire, they get a body too. But it's a body of death. Revelation talks about this, and they will be cast into the lake of fire. And it's a lake of fire forever. So it sounds like God, just not necessarily God, but Jesus wants uh, everyone to believe in him. And it's almost like an egotistical thing. Like, other, like if you don't believe believe what I'm saying, you will never, it's like teasing them with the idea of heaven, mm -hmm. and then they, like if you do all of this stuff, you're going to go to, or any of these things, you're going to go to hell, and it's almost like, they're, he's teasing them, using them to like, promote himself to mm -hmm. Uh, well, he's not being egotistical. The Bible actually teaches that he humbled himself. See, this is the Son of God. He was in heaven with the Father. Now, whether or not you believe this, I'm just telling you what the Bible states. I know it to be true. He left heaven, took on human flesh. He literally made himself lower than the angels. And Hebrews says he was tempted in all points like us, yet without sin. That means he did all the stuff like he was tempted with all any sin you can think of he was tempted with it but he never said he literally gave up all of his glory and made himself a little baby all the way to the death on the cross he was humiliated by his own creation i don't know if you ever seen like passion of the christ I'm not endorsing that movie a lot of stuff it's little stuff that's unbiblical but the beating was probably very accurate you know they they mocked him they beat him most, a lot of people died from the whipping because they ripped skin off his back. Then they finally, after mocking him after that, they go and crucify him. And they make him drag his own cross to his death. He couldn't even finish it, he was so weak. He did all of that so none of us would ever see hell. So it's not egotistical, he, that's humility. He didn't have to do that. He has every right because we have a conscience. When we came of age and we're getting tempted, man, I really want that ice cream, but mom says I shouldn't and your conscience is now screaming at you. I'm not saying a little kid, but you're of age. Your conscience is telling you, don't do that. Don't do that. You do it anyways. God put that there. And now it's your fault. 
that you sinned against God. So God did everything he could for you. Jesus is the only provision for your sin that he gave. And that's why he said, unless you come to me, I'm the only way. So, I don't necessarily, you might consider me an atheist. Yeah, that's, I don't, I don't I talk, necessarily call myself an right. atheist, but uh, I like don't necessarily believe everything or most things said in the Bible because uh -huh. it's been retranslated so many times by uneducated monks. Well, basically, I, I, I've heard so a lot of things. I, I don't, I'm. I don't want to cut you off. I just want to kind of keep up, keep up with you. With translations, that's not true. I literally have the Greek on my phone. It wasn't translated by monks. It's just not accurate. I don't know where you're getting that from. It's a common. You're not the only one, okay? They like to say it's been retranslated, retran. No, this is the truth, and I'm going to give you the hard truth. It is true that we do not have the autographs. Autographs were, are what, like, say the Apostle John. He wrote the literal letter. We do not have the autograph, okay? That's the original writing that God inspired. Inspired means God breathed in the Greek. God used a man as an instrument to write down what he wanted. So for example, if you take a guitar and you start playing it, you make great music. I wouldn't be like, dude, that guitar made great music. I'd be like, those are some great notes you made. It's an instrument in your hands. That's how God used man. We don't have any of the autographs. That's true. In fact, we have manuscripts of the manuscripts, probably of the manuscripts. Now here's the thing. This is a fact, right? I have the early church father's writings. They would not have liked to have been called fathers. That's what historians call them. The early church fathers were from the years 100 to 325. This is before any council. This is before the birth of the Catholic church. This is before the council of Nicaea. Some of these men in the very beginning were literal disciples of the apostles of Jesus. And they testify to everything we have in the New Testament because they quote it so much, okay? On top of that, our manuscripts, we got 24,000 to 25,000 manuscripts. Thousands are in the Greek, I think about 5,000. Many are in the Latin, which is a translation. The Greek was not, it is a copy. So what they did is they would take the autograph and they knew God used John to write this. He was, he knew Jesus. We got to write, we got to copy this so everybody else knows. So they would make a copy. And they made copies and copies and copies to get out to all the churches. And we have copies of these copies now. And out of all the 24,000 to 25,000 manuscripts that we have, they, they, no doctrine changes. Even with some of the copyist errors, it changes no doctrine. For example, one, one, like 30 of them may say, Jesus Christ walked on water. I'm just making a hypothetical. Maybe, maybe 200 other manuscripts say Jesus walked on water. Does it matter that Christ ain't in it? No. This is called textual criticism. You take all the manuscripts and you, you can piece together, yeah, I, we can tell how that was written. But you don't think that some of uh, it could have been lost over the, like a Bible you buy at the store today that most people are reading, there's not like... Might not be accurate, right? Yeah. Right. So it's been put through so many languages. And, well, that's... And, like they didn't have printers to... Right, like, you're right. So it's just people in a room writing it over and over again, and they're probably like paraphrasing, right? Well, no. Because well, you're you're real quick. You're dealing with people to fear God. But what I want to get at is what I have. I prefer the King James or the New King James. I read the King James, but I do look at the New King James. Now, the King James and the New King James is directly translated from the Greek. Actually, I have my phone. I could literally show you the Greek on my phone. And it's directly translate. They go to the Greek. They translate directly from that. For the Old Testament, they go to the Hebrew. So it's not a translation of a translation. That's not accurate. It's just like if you wrote something in Chinese, you translate directly into English. And, and it's just amazing that people are like, well, it's a mistrans... Dude, you can go to China right now and have a translator tell you what the Chinese person is saying. It's the same with the Koine Greek, you know what I mean, so. There's not, like, you can't pu perfectly translate, like, from one language to another, like, English just... English is more, more, it's more uh, definitive. 
I get what you're saying, because like in but Koine there's... Greek, there could be several different meanings of this word, and that's correct. But if you know the Greek, I'll give you an example. Like in 1 Corinthians, I, I think I told you guys a few minutes ago, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, college students like to argue that homosexual, that's a mistranslation. But I know the Greek. I know the Greek in that passage. And the Greek word is malakoi. It's an inflected word from the Greek word malakos. Malakos literally means you're soft. So that doesn't necessarily mean homosexual. It could be soft. Or it can mean effeminate. The so King James you, translates that very accurately by effeminate. You, you're a dude trying to be a girl, okay? The next Greek word is arsenokoitai. From the Greek word, root word, arsenokoitais, which means man with man in bed. You're doing sodomy. So it's not a mistranslation. It means what it means. Now, there are times that the Greek can have a couple different meanings, maybe a few. But the context, you can see, if you look at the Greek, it's not hard. It, like, it literally shows you, I'll just give you an example. It'll show you the definition and everything, and you can see how the context determines how it should be translated. Okay? Like, this is John 1.1. 1, 1. That's the English. That's the Greek. That's a transliteration. Now, transliteration is you take the Greek word and you match it to the phonetic sound in English so you know how to pronounce it in Greek. Okay? So, that would be N, or K, N, Ha, Lagos, Kai, Ha, Lagos, N, Pros, Theon, Kai, Ha, Lagos, N, Theos. That's the Greek. I just spoke to you the whole Greek in that passage. Okay. These now, if you're if you're wondering, okay, what is what is Theos? Is that really God? Click on it. Now this is by uh, scholars that know the Greek very well. And let's look at the definition. A god, goddess, general name of divinities or deities, the Godhead, the Trinity, God the Father. Could be Christ, could be Holy Spirit. So now we need to determine, okay, it means God, it could mean divinity. What's he saying here? They're not. What he's saying is, this is kind of a doctrinal teaching, but Lagos is Jesus. He is the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, meaning Jesus. He was in the beginning. And the Word, Jesus, was with God, the Father. And the Word, Jesus, was God. Now, he wasn't God the Father. He was deity. So, I just kind of wanted to give you an idea. You are correct in the sense that there could be a couple different translations of the word into English, but the context dictates how you translate it. Just like we wouldn't get, you wouldn't get confused like, oh, I can't trust that translation from Mandarin, you know, uh, from Mandarin Chinese or, or from uh, Arabic, you know, you, you would know how to translate it. But also, like, English itself has evolved over... Yes, it has. Yes, it has. So, when exactly what was trans it was translated from one to the other mm -hmm. could change the meaning of the text. Well, Koine Greek is actually, that's great objection you brought up. Koine Greek is actually a dead language now, yeah. so it's not living. You are correct about the English. It is still a living language, and it, it is changing. But, for example, like I have a 1611 King James Bible, and if you read the 1611, like, dude, it's a little more difficult to read. Like, S's were like, it looks like a long F, right? I don't know if you know that, but yeah, it's more difficult to read. Uh, so yeah, it has changed over time, that's, that's for sure. Um, but God wants you to have the truth. I mean, it's right there. And, uh, you yeah, know, we have all the evidence. In fact, the New Testament itself, this is a fact. You can go to even atheists, like they know this. That the New Testament has more historical proof to it than any other document you will ever read in history. Now, it doesn't mean you have to believe it. It's just saying there's more proof to it. 
you know, like some of Plato's writings or, or some of these philosophers of the past. They barely have any writings, yet you you guys believe in them. But yet there's 24,000 to 25,000 manuscripts. Think about that. 24,000 to 25,000 manuscripts, yet they all align. There's some small differences here and there, and it changes nothing. It's amazing how that's been preserved. There's nothing that has been like, like totally cut out where it's like, well, maybe Jesus didn't really walk on water. No, they, they all say he walked on water. Well, maybe Jesus didn't say he'll cast them in the fire. No, he said he'd cast them in the fire. Okay. But you want to say something else? Uh, like, I mean, it's kind of unrelated, but I don't know my, I have with the Bible. Is that there's some, like, there's some parts of it where it's at, almost acting like a history book telling you it what is. happened. It is. Keep some, some, uh, so, some, yeah, some, 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 might be. Um, yeah, some parts, so like like in the Old Testament, a lot of it is historical. The book of Acts in the New Testament is historical. Uh, the first four Gospels to the New Testament, that's historical. Then you also have wisdom literature. You also have didactic literature. I don't want to say literature, scripture, I'm sorry. I'm so used to speaking about manuscripts and literature. Um, you have some, um, you got some scripture that's didactic, meaning teaching for doctrine. So yeah, there is historical, um, there is historical scripture. But my, I mean, some of it has been proven to be true, whereas other parts, I don't know the exact number, but they okay. say the. You'd have uh, to tell me a specific. The Earth is uh, like younger than. Yeah, I, I believe that. I used to believe in the idea of like maybe an old Earth. This, I'm gonna challenge your thinking. I think about it. you've been just like I was. You've been beat in the head since you were young. Dinosaurs were 65 million years ago. You've been hearing it since you were a little kid because you, you were probably like most boys read. And it was amazing. But I'm gonna challenge your thinking. Number one, the Bible talks about dinosaurs with humans. Why are these men writing about a behemoth and Leviathan, which has a tail like a cedar. I, I could show it to you in Job, I believe it's chapter 40. What is he describing? A massive animal where the power is in his hips and he has a tail like a cedar. Massive. Okay, right. Uh, in the King James, it translates some of these Hebrew words as dragons. Now that might sound crazy to you, but dinosaur is a new word yeah, since dragon. probably like, right. And if you look outside the Bible, I'm not even, put the Bible aside for a minute. If you look through civilizations, even recent ones that atheists would say are recent, a few thousand years ago, why before a dinosaur was ever discovered, a dinosaur bone, why are all these civilizations drawing pictures of people fighting drag, what looks exactly like a dinosaur? When, where'd they get this idea from? And why is it all over the world? I mean, it's in caves, it's on pottery. Where is that coming from? What You're telling me the whole world, different tribes across different areas of the planet are all believing in this idea of people fighting these, what, they call them dragons, but what looks like dinosaurs. Where are they getting this idea from? And I know that sounds crazy, but I'm telling you, check me out. Look at it yourself. It's it's all over the place. But you know how you can find like uh, fossils of animals that have markings that are clearly humans hunting them or fighting them. Why has that never been found for a brachiosaur? Yeah, I, I don't I don't know that. I I'm ignorant on that subject. Like I don't know. I couldn't say you're wrong. I couldn't say you're right. I don't know. But I mean, think of like if I if I went and I stabbed him. No, I would not do that. But if I stabbed him like it's going to go through the flesh and I mean I might break his bone but we don't know how it was broken so I like I can't really engage with that I don't know I do know this real quick I wanted to say this it is true you can find this on the internet that a t-rex bone was discovered with soft tissue and the platelets and all that now how in the world is that possible they didn't even have an answer for this it wasn't frozen now but it wasn't frozen so how could that be possible from 65 million years ago it's like the same way uh like mosquitoes or stuff like that can be preserved in amber but it wasn't preserved in amber 
Well, it, so I know it challenges your thing. I don't. It, I think they. Yeah, you'll have to look at it. Um, he may be able to address it more. Uh, usually, with an atheist, I'll deal philosophically. So, if you claim to be an atheist, um, I love science. By the way, I'm not a science denier. But we need to establish our terms. Science is whatever you can test, observe, and reproduce. Anything outside of that is not science. It's an idea or a theory, okay? Now, if it's true that there's no God, all right, and you, we evolved from goo to zoo to you, which is essentially what an atheist believes. Well, you got a lot of problems. Number one, you'd have to believe in abiogenesis, which means that life comes from non-life. Never been proven, and it's not scientific. It's a theory. It's not proven. You've never seen that. Can you not think for yourself? Now, I remember, I think it was one time a student tried to tell me, but, but we put together this crude amino acid in the laboratory. I'm like, you just proved my point. Life created life. It wasn't not, this concrete is not going to produce life. It's not going to happen. It's dead. It's not alive. It's never had life. It's non-life. So um, that's what I would challenge you with is you'd have to believe in abiogenesis. <clears throat> um, to engage in science, you have to use the principle of induction, meaning that when you go to test, observe, and reproduce things, you're looking for patterns. Why are you assuming that there's patterns? That's an assumption. That's not science. You're assuming that. That's an assumption. You have faith that there will always be patterns. That's faith. Okay? Just like I have faith in the Bible, it's still faith. You haven't proven it. You're assuming it. You're also assuming your five senses are working properly. If you evolved from a monkey and a monkey evolved from this and that and that, goo to zoo to you, why are you assuming your five senses are working properly? Because usually I, I'm not, I'm not going to do it to you, but this is what I'll typically do with an atheist. I'll say, prove to me your five senses are working properly. And they'll usually say, well, I can see you, I can hear you, it works. I'm like, if you know philosophy, that's called begging the question. That's circular reasoning. You can't prove the answer by assuming it. So you, you're going into engaging in science with assumptions. But go ahead. I, I, you want to say something? My, uh, I don't necessarily know for, for sure for myself mm -hmm. if I believe it or not. But like in a cell of a any living being, you can figure out what chemicals make up each little atom in there. Mm -hmm. And if you were to somehow put them together in that exact arrangement, it would be life. And if the universe is however many billion years old, it's possible that at some point, maybe it happened earlier, maybe it happened later, that those chemicals just happened to be together, rocks smashed together, the right stuff was there at the right time, and that's where it all began. And then it became rep it became replicated. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I've heard that argument, but that's basically what they believe typically, is that basically like it rained for millions of years and the, chemical, the chemicals released, put themselves, but that's still, that's not provable. That's your faith. If you have faith in that, it's still faith. It's not science. As long as we agree that's not science, it's a theory. That's all I mean, I'm saying. It's it's, it's, it's not a scientific. Based on scientific, like. But they have you have to test it, you have to observe it, you have to reproduce it. It's never happened. I guarantee you, if you take this concrete right now, I'll give you everything I've got. If you take that, you ain't gonna get life that sustains itself. It's not gonna happen. I don't care how long you rain on that ledge there. It's not gonna happen. That's non-life. You only get life from life. So it just makes sense. Yeah, we, it kind of gets back to the Jesus thing. Even if you don't know about Jesus, you can look around like, I see this library in front of me. I know for a fact that did not come together by itself. And it's not because I know all these people around. It's just common sense. There's no way. Right. Well, there's no way that any of that put itself together. Likewise, I can look around at the stars, the clouds, the sky, and it's like there's no way that this just, there was nothing, and then poof, no intelligent creator behind it. It's impossible. It's not science. It's faith. If you want to have that faith, okay, but it's it's still faith. It's not science. I don't, I don't know everything, obviously. Yeah, I don't either, dude. I don't. <laughs> 
like, you're I know, so you one of my thoughts is that there was a deity of some sort, mm. put everything in motion, left it be. There's no heaven, no hell, you die. You okay, die. that would be, just, right. So maybe then, now you sound more like, I like a deist. So a deist believes that, okay, there's an intelligent creator behind all this. I think Einstein may have believed that, like he was a deist. I, yeah, I, he didn't believe in Jesus from what I, I know, but he was more, I think he was more, I know he wasn't Christian. Right, right, right. I believe he was more a deist. So he was, he looked around, very intelligent guy, but he didn't turn to Jesus as far as we know. But, but, but the fact is that he was like, look, there's an intelligent creator. But he just believed that, I think he may have believed that idea that, okay, something like an intelligent creator put this together and then he just leaves it alone. But, then I would deal with you logically. You have, if there's an intelligent creator that created all this along with us, he made you in his image, okay? Like, I mean, because he's creative. Now, you, you have the law of cause and effect. This is a law, okay? The law of cause and effect. The cause is always greater to, or at least equal to, the effect. So, once again, if God is the, any God, whatever God you want to say, this intelligent creator, if he is the cause, and we are the effect, then he must be at least greater than or equal to us in how we are. So for example, if I took you on a desert island and you'd never see anybody ever again the rest of your life, you'd be absolutely miserable. Okay? To have the, the belief that God made everything and then he just steps back would break that law of cause and effect because he's the cause so if we love he loves if we have hatred now we do it wrongly he also has a hatred but it's a holy hatred if we get jealous he he has jealousy he wants to have fellowship with people that he created us like him he could have just explaining something like maybe we're just one of his experience right. experiments. There's 80 million universes, right. and we're just a different mm -hmm. ant that he put together. Right. Fair point. But once again, it's the idea of the cause and effect. If 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 he's the cause, we're the effect. You know. Yeah. I. I right. I mean, you could sit there and believe. Well, you know, it's like ants. You know, he just creates us, and so what. But it just, it, it seems to violate that law of cause and effect, because if he's a cause, why would he create mankind just to be like, I don't care? Like, why you, he could have just made us, yeah, but, but then he's still, he's still not really deist then, he's, he's got some kind of involvement, he's sitting back watching, right? But fair points, I'll kid, yeah, fair points, but... Think about the fact that he gave you free will. If he wanted to just use you for entertainment, he'd make you a certain way. He'd make you do what he wants you to do, make that person do what he wants to do, and maybe put you guys together to fight it out or kill each other. Or, But he, give, he gives you free will, and here's why. He gives you free will because he wants you to choose to love him, to follow him. So like my wife, I'm married. I love my wife. She's fantastic. And if I could go push a button on the back of her head or on the back of her neck and make her love me, it's not love. Really, it's rape. It's it's like making her a robot. And and there's good, there's not going to be any intimacy, no fellowship. She's just a robot. It's just a program. In order to have a loving relationship, there it must necessitate free will. So God gave you free will, all of us free will, so we would choose to love him because what he desires is a loving relationship with his creation. Yeah. I, even though a person might suffer and struggle, it doesn't give us the right to kill Can I ask you a question? Hey. It's just something to think about, man. That's it, man. Did I give you a card? If you ever feel like reaching out, man, all right? That's all I'm doing, man. I'm, I'm just making you think. Hey, look, dude, like years ago, 
a little more, I don't know, 18 years ago or whatever it was, I was agnostic, man. I didn't believe in this stuff. Now, I was an atheist. I wasn't like, there is no God. I was like, I may have said, like you said, like maybe there's a God and he doesn't care. Maybe maybe Jesus is the son of God. I don't know. Uh, maybe maybe aliens brought us, dude. I'd say stuff like that, you know? I, I used to get high and sit around and be like, dude, maybe aliens brought us, man, you know? I was agnostic, like I, I just didn't care. Um, but he spoke to me. And he'll speak to anybody that's willing with a broken heart to pick up his word and just seek him and really be open to, are you really the son of God? Now, if you're like, well, you know, he's probably not, you're just being doubtful. But I also think that humans created the concept of God for things they couldn't understand, like how natives had the god of mm. water, the god of air. The right, god all of kinds, blah, 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 right. Because they couldn't explain it because they didn't have science right. to say why what? hydrogen and oxygen go together and make water. They didn't know. Right, they so, didn't know some things so we do. we don't know where we came from. We came up with the idea of God to try to explain it to ourselves. You, you could think that. H however, there's some problems there, like the Mayan civilization, like down in Mexico and stuff. I believe it's that tribe that we've been actually finding out. They were way more advanced than what we thought. Uh, like the pyramids in Egypt. You know we can't even put that together today? Wait a minute, I thought we're so smart. How, how did this happen? I mean, you, I mean, I don't know if you know this, but we literally cannot put it together exactly like they did. How is that possible? I don't know. I, I'm just, I'm just, it's something to think about. So, no, I'm not saying they, like, I think it was the Greek philosophers that started coming up with this idea of atoms. You know what I mean? If I'm correct, I might be wrong about that. Um, but I believe it was the Greek was, philosophers that came up. growth of the idea. Yeah, it developed over time. Get smaller to right. a point where there is no more smaller thing. Yeah, they, they came up with this idea and, and it was, but it was amazing that they were pretty accurate. They didn't have microscopes like we do now. Um, but just think about the things we talked about, man, you know? That's all I'm here to do, just give people the truth and you do with it what you want, man, you know? Any other questions or? I'm hungry. <laughs> yeah, so am I, dude. Hey, thanks for talking to me, man. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then it vanishes away. What is this life that you live, and all of these things that you live for? What do they matter? In light of eternity, the unending emptiness in you, and oh, how you run from all that's true. You turn and say that it's all okay. Remember those nights all by yourself. You thought about heaven, death, and hell. And then you chase away all reality. Though death is uncertain, life can be to all who in Jesus now are free. To all who have the victory, cause you have a one life to answer for. Will it be your one desire? Faithful to the Lord, you have one life, one life to give. Will you serve a sinful heart or cry out to Jesus?